Good morning. Are you all asleep out there? Good morning. Good, good, good. Welcome back to Saturday Classes. Now, those of you who are my age and older know about Saturday Classes. You young folks, you missed a great opportunity. Instead of sleeping in on Saturday morning, you would get up, you would go to the lab, and you would do an experiment which undoubtedly was going to fail. Now, it may have been failing because you were dead asleep. It may have been failing because you didn't do it right. And it may have been failing because the physics department intended it to, to teach you a lesson about physics. On the other hand, we're not going to have any experiments this morning. Welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, what, believe it or not, is my last welcome for a uh, technology day. I've done this for 23 years now. And uh, I, uh, I've actually held a job for almost half of its historical history. And I'm uh, finally going to go half time on July 1st. So welcome back to tech. Uh, as you know, uh, those of you who are my age and have a little gray in your hair, this place keeps changing, and for the most part, for the better. It's my pleasure this morning to do one thing, and that's introduce our president, Chuck Vest. Thank you very much, Bill. This being MIT, I carry some instrumentation around. It measures the relative humidity, and it works this way. When I make it from Gray House, the president's home, to Kresge in five minutes flat and stand up to speak, it's a question of how quickly my glasses fog up. So just watch them and you'll tell. Uh, before we begin this morning, I just really want to be sure that everybody heard what Bill Hecht just said. We've been remarkably fortunate as an institution to have an individual who has been so dedicated and so effective to maintaining the alumni family of MIT strong and vigorous and moving forward. It's been a terrific run. It, uh, of course, uh, as uh, Bill said, he's held the job for the majority of its existence. He's held it for all of my existence as a member of the community. And Bill, I just want to personally thank you and thank you on behalf of those thousands of men and women out there who owe so much to you. Thank you. But being MIT, we have a new vice president and one who will be equally extraordinary and wonderful in her tenure, Beth Garvin, who's also with us this morning. Beth, welcome. Well, I know she's here somewhere because I saw her a few moments ago, but let's, uh, let's get down to work. It's really a great time to welcome all of you back to your campus because this has been an absolutely terrific year in terms of accomplishment and momentum on the part of our faculty and our students, as well as our staff and our alumni. I think you've had a look around at parts of the campus, and you can see steel and brick and metal and some other materials. You probably are wondering what they are rising here and there. These are the physical or outward symbols of an institution that is both bold and very confident in its future. And I think we have good reason for both that boldness and certainly for that confidence in our future. The campus is continuing its transformation in the area of residential and community life. This year alone, we opened Simmons Hall, a magnificent new undergraduate dormitory uh, just to the north of the playing fields. We opened a much larger residence hall for graduate students a little bit further to the north at the intersection of Sydney and Pacific Streets. And we opened the magnificent Zessiger Sports and Fitness Center, which I hope all of you have an opportunity to have a look at while you are here. I must say I've never anywhere seen or heard of a building that has had a more instantaneous transformational 
effect on a campus community as has the Zessiger Center. The Z Center, as it is uh, known uh, in the vernacular, with its magnificent Olympic pool and workout rooms and squash courts and so forth, and it's just busy and humming 24 hours a day and mixing together our staff and our students and our faculty in really an extraordinary way and, of course, contributing to the wellness of our community. In the agenda for research and teaching, we are in the final stages of what has been a horrendous but very important project to renovate the chemistry building from top to bottom to really bring it up to modern standards uh, of safety and so forth to allow us to continue the movement of chemistry into so many new areas of nanoscale science and biologically based chemistry and so forth, and uh, to do so in a way that is safe, that minimizes the amounts of chemicals that need to be used and so forth. It's just wonderful. About two-thirds of it is finished and occupied. We're doing the last phase. Uh, even as we speak this morning. And I hope you all have seen the Ray and Maria Stata Center for Computational Information and Intelligence Sciences that's rising at the site of the famous Building 20 and really in so many ways symbolizes the advance of MIT into a new century. It has two major elements the Alex Dreyfus Building and the Bill Gates Building. And I just hope you do have a look at Frank Gehry's magnificent structure, which is about at the point you can begin to really sense what it's going to be like as a building. And I'm sure this time next year we will be holding some portion of these events within it. Last week, we had uh, the groundbreaking over the last two weeks for the new brain and cognitive science complex that will consist of three integrated buildings, the McGovern Institute for Brain Research, the Pickauer Center for Learning and Memory, and the facilities of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science itself. Very may a symbol of a very major intellectual advance for the campus. In terms of quality of life, we're slowly but surely working away at all the important infrastructure, the terribly important things that you don't see, life safety systems in the residence halls and so forth, and also making some advances toward improving our streetscapes. Uh, you will see within the next year that at least the eastern part of Vassar Street, uh, that is to the uh, east of Mass Ave, is going to become the kind of uh, thoroughfare that this uh, campus really uh, and its people really deserve with nice paving and trees and bicycle paths and a little less parking and so forth. Going to be a, a, great, uh, a great improvement. Uh, in teaching and research, we continue to have the best there is. We celebrated two remarkable anniversaries this year. Back in the fall, we celebrated the 50th year of the Sloan School of Management in a wonderful MIT combination of intellectual events and celebration. And just over the la uh, just last week, we had an extraordinary celebration of the 100th year of electrical engineering uh, here at MIT with, again, a magnificent set of lectures as well as celebratory events. And I made the statement at the opening of that event that I'm going to repeat here. I do not believe there has ever existed an academic department in any institution in the world that has had as much influence on education and also on practice in its field as has MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. At that, good, fine. <laughs> I'll vote with that. At that time, it was announced that the uh, Laboratory for Computer Science and the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory have merged to form a new entity. And also, during the intervening week, we opened the new uh, uh, Institute for Soldier Nanotechnology, which is a remarkable $50 million undertaking of our faculty and students on behalf of the US Army, which will also form an incredible platform for the young faculty from many different departments who put this program together to explore the new world of 
nanoscale science and nanoscale engineering. Computational and systems biology, again a cross-disciplinary group put together by an extraordinary group of young faculty here at MIT is something I think you will be reading about over the coming decade. They're just a remarkable group of people with wonderful ideas about how to blend the way engineers think with the way biologists and medical doctors must think as we enter this new century. We've continued innovation in teaching and, level and learning at all levels. Our open courseware program uh, will really ramp up this fall with about 500 subjects on it, and our pilot sites uh, have had just remarkable responses from across the country and especially all around the world. But the heart of all of this is our remarkable faculty and our students. This fall, the class of 2007 will arrive, and I have to tell you, every year these young men and women get better and better. It's going to be a truly remarkable group. This year, MIT faculty were recognized by receiving the highest awards in virtually each of our core areas. Uh, that began with the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology that went to Bob Horvitz of our biology department, our cancer center, and also the McGovern Institute for Brain Research for his pioneering work some years back in understanding programmed cell death, which has great importance, of course, to the field of cancer research and as he is beginning to learn to the field of neuroscience as well. The National Medal of Science went to Ann Graybill of our Brain and Cognitive Science Department. And I have to tell you, I was fortunate to be in the White House for that event, and it felt really good to see eight men and one woman, one woman on the stage, and she was the one from MIT. We were very proud of Ann. <laughs> the Draper Prize. The Draper Prize this year, the highest award an engineer can win in the United States, went to our own Bob Langer for his incredible work in biotechnology. And by the way, uh, Bob was the cover boy of the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine last week with a big banner headline that said, the smartest man in Boston. How would you like to live up to that? <laughs> That's quite an accomplishment. The Turing Award, the Turing Award, the highest computer science award given uh, in the world, really, went to Ron Rivest, who shared it with two uh, former MIT people for their seminal work on public key encryption uh, some years back. But even more important to me is what's happening with our very young faculty. Uh, we had uh, Sunil Melanathan in economics, won one of the so-called uh, MacArthur Genius Awards this year. And Angela Amon, a young professor in our biology department won what in many ways to me is the most impressive award in this entire list, which is the Waterman Award that the National Science Board gives every year to one, one scientist or engineer in any field for research accomplishments under the age of 35. And so the future, I can tell you, is at least as bright as the present and as our past. And finally, this last week, it was announced that Kristen Forbes, a young applied economist uh, uh, here at MIT in the Sloan School, has been nominated to serve on President Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. So I'm through bragging for a little while, Mr. Lash, and I think it's uh, time to get on with seeing the substance behind the bragging. We have a wonderful morning put together for you to sample a bit of the intellectual potpourri that is MIT. And to start that, I would like to introduce to you your president of the Alumni Association, my friend and colleague, Jim Lash. Jim? I am not the substance, just to be clear about that. Uh, you have, of course, your booklet. And the booklet outlines the program for today. My job is to try to keep it moving along. Um, I will be introducing the speakers. And after I've introduced each speaker and they've given their talk, there will be a brief question and answer period. You should have received, when you came in, three by five cards on which you may write your questions. Uh, we're not going to be picking those cards up. We want you to read the question from the card. Why would we do that? 
Well, it's because the speeches are to be given on the stage, not out there. And you're not to come on the stage, so we want you to, uh, to try to keep it brief because we only have a short period of time. Um, the program this morning uh, consists of five individuals, actually today, consists of five individuals, one from each of our schools. Uh, the first is Dr. Lawrence Vale, head of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and he will be speaking with us today on the subject of housing the lowest income Americans, the past, present, and future of public housing. You have his biography in your material, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how committed he is to this subject. I have a long list of books and articles he has written on this subject, and they have titles like Urban Design for Urban Development, the Future of Planned Poverty, Redeveloping America's Most Distressed Public Housing Projects, From the Puritans to the Projects, The Ideological Origins of American Public Housing, Public Housing and the American Dream, Residents' Views of Buying into the Projects. Without further ado, Dr. Vale. At this uh, time of reunions, uh, when alumni and alumni come uh, back on their alma maters, I realize I'm something of a 20th century relic. I, I finished a graduate program here at MIT 15 years ago and forgot to leave, um, uh, and have never applied for any other job than the one I currently hold, uh, a, a very strange notion. Uh, although faculty members, even here at MIT, sometimes like to complain about salaries, my title today, Housing the Lowest Income Americans, is not meant to be particularly autobiographical. Um, um, uh, rather, I wanted to spend a, a few moments with you uh, today talking about public housing, which, uh, aside from prisons, I think, is probably the country's most uh, vilified and uh, stigmatized domestic environment. If you ask people these days where it is that they think the lowest, Amer lowest income Americans live, they, they probably don't give you an answer like slums or ghettos anymore. They probably would say public housing. Uh, and uh, there are 1.3 million households, uh, about four or five million Americans living in uh, public housing today. And uh, the census showed that during the 1990s, nine out of the 10 uh, most distressed, economically most distressed neighborhoods in the country were in fact public housing projects, uh, something that were largely uh, the creation of direct federal policy, uh, a strange notion. Um, the worst uh, examples of public housing certainly deserve their, their dismal reputation, although most public housing, uh, especially in smaller communities, is functioning quite well. We sometimes forget that there are 3,500 public housing authorities across the country, and we usually hear the, the most negative things only about the, the, the few in some of the largest cities that have uh, gone so far astray. But they've failed so dramatically that it's understandable that that, that happens. Um, uh, so my, my, uh, my interest in this uh, is to try and put some perspective on it going both backwards and, and forwards. And, and I really have been struggling uh, for the last several years with two, two questions in particular. Uh, how and why did public housing in this country fall into such ill repute? And second, what can be done to fix this? Uh, the, uh, both of them turn out to be fairly complicated uh, questions. Um, let me uh, begin by asking you to uh, uh, judge a couple of books by their covers. Uh, they're, they're up there, probably not the uh, best thing to do. Uh, n neither of these books is, is likely to become a bestseller, but at least uh, displayed this way, I can claim that they're the largest sellers. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I'll be sure to tell this to Harvard University Press. Um, uh, the, uh, the book on the left, uh, I, I'm reminded uh, by the title of today being Fast Times at MIT. You, you'll see whether I qualify. The book on the left uh, started as research on my undergraduate thesis in 1980 and was published as a book a mere 20 years later. Um, and the book on the right fared only slightly better. I, I began work on it during my first semester as a master's student and completed it this fall during my first semester as a department head. Um, 
so I'm not a particularly uh, speedy researcher, but these are problems, uh, these are really not problems that emerge quickly or that will be solved quickly. Uh, the title of the, uh, the book on the left, the first book, the, From the Puritans to the Projects, is meant to suggest that the problem of public housing is embedded in about 350 years of past cultural practices, uh, specifically notions about work ethics and uh, a sense that, the, that poverty is usually caused by some sort of individual moral failing uh, and, and a belief that government, uh, the town, has an obligation to help those who are worst off, uh, the people that I call in the subtitle public neighbors, um, uh, that the government would step in the town if those people couldn't be supported by their family or by private uh, charities. Uh, here in Boston, that's the way things worked 350 years ago. Um, in that view of the world, the single, family pub, uh, the single family home was the thing that really remained supreme, uh, even, even hundreds of years ago uh, as it does now. And multifamily housing, uh, going back historically, was something that was associated with institutions. Um, the, the second project, uh, which culminated in the, the book Reclaiming Public Housing, uh, is attempting to tell the story of public housing primarily from the viewpoint of its tenants. Um, in other words, the first project is a long story about how various institutions managed poverty in cities, uh, a tale of where people in positions of power uh, chose to put the poorest citizens uh, and where, where poor people tended to need to gather uh, as well, whereas the second book is a more of a bottom-up kind of story. It's about the rise of public housing, uh, a, a, a rise that, that many of the people in this room uh, can remember was during a period of optimism about what the government could do for low-income people in housing. Um, but it's also about the collapse of public housing, uh, and um, most importantly, it's about three ambitious attempts to try and revitalize particular housing developments, uh, reclaiming them not just as buildings, but as safe and secure communities for continued occupancy by very low income households. Uh, the advantage of taking so long to, uh, to write these books is that I was able to watch uh, and observe uh, the transformation of these uh, places uh, over a period of uh, more than 15 years. I asked you to judge these books by their, uh, their covers, uh, but doing so also means uh, looking closely at what isn't there. Um, even those of you who are, are, are close up probably can, can recognize that people are not shown uh, in, in either of these covers. Um, the key ethical challenge uh, for my work uh, really is to make sure that I always remember that I'm not writing about buildings, um, or at least not just about buildings, but about the people who design and manage and transform and live in these buildings. Uh, more than 300 interviews were conducted with such people. So my challenge has been to try and contribute to uh, scholarship in history and urban planning and social science, but also to make sure that my books were going to do so in a way that paid full respect to the people that I was writing about. I call this the doing projects in the projects challenge. Um, there is a glaring disparity here that, that I, I want to be upfront about with you. Uh, a researcher from the second richest institution in Cambridge, uh, and I, well, maybe that's not right, maybe Harvard is in Boston now. Um, in, um, uh, um, but anyway, uh, coming from a place of, of wealth and privilege, uh, privilege uh, I'm spending years studying uh, some of the, uh, the poorest people in Boston. So what do these people uh, gain from my study, right? Uh, how can I avoid the sort of intrusive exploitation that has characterized uh, past generations of social science uh, research? In other words, what's in this for them? Um, I don't have a, a time now for a full discussion of that question, but I want to emphasize that I began the inquiry with the public housing tenants themselves uh, through slowly nurtured relationships with the, uh, the leadership and others at the, uh, the tenant organizations uh, in the housing developments that I was attempting to analyze. The tenants themselves helped shape the kinds of questions that, that were asked of their fellow tenants. Uh, and encouraged me to, uh, to find ways to raise issues that were going to be important uh, to them as well as to me. 
that was really the prerequisite for uh, mutual trust. Uh, and it constituted the only hope that I had that the kind of interviews that were going to be done with these people who otherwise had no particular uh, reason to trust me or my institution, uh, that they were going to be honest and, uh, and open and candid. Uh, the most critical thing was to uh, a decision to actually hire public housing uh, residents themselves to do much of the in uh, interviewing and to train them and to try and provide them with a skill to come out of this. Um, rather than the white male professor coming across the river uh, to do his project in the projects, I was hoping um, that the tenants would be able to see this as something more of a joint uh, venture. Um, and I wanted them to see that the most of the money that went to this uh, research was going to them rather than to uh, the MIT student RAs that they perceived as rich and privileged people, even though uh, those same students regarded themselves as low income uh, individuals uh, uh, on this side of the river. Um, so what I was doing was valuing their time uh, at, at the rate of $10 an hour and implicitly valuing their viewpoints by, by doing that. So the result was 267 hour-long taped interviews uh, in, in four languages. They were conducted in four languages that were really intended to, uh, to get at a much broader range of opinion and viewpoint, uh, not just the loud activist ten tenant spokesperson, but to try and get at what people who hadn't been asked about anything had to say about life in public housing and what could happen. Um, it had a lot of downsides, uh, certainly, uh, mostly due to the logistical complexity of that and to the highly variable interviewing skills of the uh, people we hired. And I'm sure that it never really was fully uh, viewed as the joint venture that I intended, but I, I still think it, it, it marks uh, a small attempt uh, to counter some of the stereotypes that still are prevalent about people living in public housing and the worlds they inhabit. Uh, so let me just now, uh, with, uh, with the aid of some illustrations, spend a few minutes uh, illustrating three aspects of uh, American public housing struggle. Uh, first is the struggle uh, to build public housing in a country that venerates home ownership and individual initiative. Um, second is the struggle to maintain uh, the high idealism that initially characterized public housing uh, construction. And third uh, is the struggle to reclaim public housing projects for continued occupancy by low-income people. Um, so if you look at the, uh, what, I, what I tend to call the prehistory of public housing, uh, arguing that it goes back uh, 350 years and not just to the New Deal like most people uh, think of it, there is a long-term uh, tension between two trends. Uh, one, a sense that if government and the state uh, are involved, uh, in any kind of housing provision for low-income people, that it ought to be a reward for the best kind of people. It ought to be recognizing your, your contributions to the town, your service to country through veterans programs, through land grants and things like that. Or um, alternatively, uh, it, it, it ought to be acknowledging that the federal government or the state government or some form of government has a kind of public obligation to the least advantaged, that it's a kind of way of coping with poverty a coping mechanism. Um, so I always try to think of public housing in the context uh, of its antithesis, the, the private home. Uh, some of you may not be able to read uh, all of this, and I don't have the, uh, the little laser, printer, uh, laser pointer with me to, uh, to show this, but uh, what it says here is, his castle, homeowning, breeds real men. Uh, and then in the fine print at the bottom, it says, it's what puts the man back in manhood. Uh, this is a... An, an illustration from the uh, 1922 uh, booklet by the National Association of Real Estate Boards called Own Your Own Home. Um, here, uh, does Brown own his home? No, he rents. Uh, haven't you seen him scratch matches on the wallpaper? Um, there is this inferior moral being uh, out here known as the renter uh, that is being uh, vilified and, and stigmatized by, uh, by this alternative. Uh, so the kinds of images of home ownership in the years immediately uh, preceding public housing, the homeowner as the most efficient workman and the most successful in business and the professions at the upper left, a home as the best known incentive to persistent and organized effort, um, or, or down below, uh, the, the woman in her garden where it says, what woman does not yearn for, a, for her own garden and flowers? The work of caring for them and the sunshine help to keep her young. Or the woman in the, 
Uh, and, if, and if the garden weren't enough, uh, the modern kitchen of the owned home, uh, the little caption says, no drudgery here. Uh, 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 so, uh, so this is what you gain. Or, or finally, for, for children, um, it, uh, it, what it says here is, every child has the right to a home of its own. The child raised in a rented house or apartment is cheated. It makes childhood happier. Um, so this is the sort of thing that's going on. And, and we know it well historically, uh, going back to the 19th century, the Homestead Act. Uh, there, there's one from Oklahoma uh, on the left. Uh, and then uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, there was a, an organization in the 19 teens uh, called the Homestead Commission uh, that was uh, building houses for worthy, upwardly mobile workers in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, one of the earliest forms. So you have this kind of reward trend, uh, tradition for, uh, on the one hand, uh, trying to, to say that they, the, the way that government belongs in, in housing is to reward the people who are the most deserving, who are going to work the land or who have served as veterans or who have done uh, one thing or another uh, to, uh, to gain uh, from that. And uh, alternatively, uh, there's this other long tradition about uh, housing and government involvement as a kind of coping mechanism. Uh, this is a, the almshouse in Boston on Leverett Street, uh, uh, right about where Mass General is now, or part of it, uh, that was built in 1800 uh, to replace the earlier uh, almshouse on Boston Common. It was designed by Charles Bullfinch, uh, the, the same designer as the, uh, the new state house. Uh, and uh, when they built the new state house, they didn't want the old alms, alms house across the street from it, uh, and so it, it moved over, but, but got very prominent kind of things. So people that really couldn't afford to maintain themselves on the town were there, and then gradually uh, uh, went even, even further. The, uh, now that I have my pointer, that's the Boston Peninsula that was there in the 19th century, and what initially happened was that, that Leverett House one was about as far as you could get to that point, and then that wasn't far enough or big enough, and so they moved it all the way out to Deer Island, uh, which at that point was still an island, and built this thing by 1850 as a almshouse and house of industry, meaning able-bodied people should be put to work um, it was actually almost a, a form of incarceration with visits only possible once every three months. Uh, and, they, and it being an island, they didn't allow for anybody to elope, was the phrase, uh, meaning escape uh, from, uh, uh, from it at the, at the time. So you, so you had this kind of sense of, of put, people, put poor people in an institution. Uh, of course, most people uh, were, were left in tenements on the mainland. And this book that came out in 1893 is Boston's equivalent of uh, uh, the famous Jacob Rees book, How the Other Half Lives, uh, is called uh, Civilization's Inferno Studies in the Social Cellar. Uh, and what it was was a, a study of what happened while the people were dancing on the streets of, uh, in, the, in the townhouses of Beacon Hill or the Back Bay uh, and the levels of poverty that existed. Uh, the worthy people looking for work over here uh, the widows and orphans who were poor through no fault of their own, and then the so-called social seller, the, the, the world of vice and illicit behavior and all of the sorts of things. And the attempt was to figure out which of these people you should care about. Uh, do you care about these people and these people, but not those people? How do you distinguish uh, what happens in the inferno of civilization? Uh, but it's not until the 20th century uh, that people started to, to worry about this in any, uh, any great detail. Uh, this is a map of Boston and, uh, and Cambridge uh, showing what they called to be uh, sections in which are blighted areas that may be considered for rehousing projects. That was the phrase. Uh, so we're, uh, there's Main Street and where Memorial Drive would be running there. So we're just sort of in, in here. There's Mass Ave. Um, and, and if you know Cambridge, you know that there are two very large public housing developments right here at that Main Street uh, intersection uh, over there. Uh, that did get built. So this is the idea. But the question was, well, what was meant by re rehousing projects? Uh, uh, the, the authority came to power. This is uh, the way the Boston Housing Authority preferred to uh, self-reference themselves. Um, uh, so these five guys and their, uh, and their uh, descendants um, uh, were in charge, uh, self-appointed, of, of picking who was going to go into public housing. Uh, Boston, uh, shown here at the top, 
had two big bursts, one pre-war and one post-war, where all of the housing was built. Uh, this is the national picture, which also has the pre-war spike, a post-war spike, but had more activity in the 50s and 60s. Boston stopped building the large public housing projects for families in 1954, um, ahead of most other cities, but, was, but did a lot of it very, very soon. Um, and uh, what was happening, at least in the older days, is that there were neighborhoods being taken uh, like this one with hundreds of individual structures, including uh, homes that people owned and businesses that were owned, uh, that were simply being torn down. A line is drawn around it, and it's, it's rebuilt. This is the Mission Hill district in, in uh, Roxbury, uh, one of the first one in 1940 that was, was taken. And this question of rehousing project uh, turned out that it was about um, building new housing over here, but not really about rehousing those people into this place. Uh, what, I, what happened when I looked back at it and, and looked at the population records, I found that between 50 and 70 or 50 and 80 percent of the people in these various uh, neighborhoods that were being torn down uh, expressed an interest in moving to public housing, but when, it, uh, when they actually built it, only between 2 and 12 percent actually got in because these people had the wrong family size. Uh, they, they might have been single individuals, or they might have had an extended family. Uh, they might not have had a US citizen at the head of the household. Uh, they might have been the wrong race uh, for a project that was going to be only for one race uh, or the other. Uh, and it was a black-white issue in those, in those days in Boston. Uh, they might have uh, not had a stable enough job uh, because public housing was a reward in those days. It wasn't a coping mechanism. It was a reward uh, for the people who, uh, who really had demonstrated uh, good citizenship and good housekeeping and were likely to make maximum advantage and move on uh, as quickly as possible so someone else could take their place. Um, that's the kind of thing that was happening. Uh, the, the idea was, uh, as the cartoon here says, uh, it says the man's holding the bag here of the slum clearance tool, and it says uh, uh, disease, dispiritedness, delinquency, we hope you'll be gone with the slums. Uh, the idea was uh, you, you uh, tear down the slums and you eliminate the problems, but what was lost in the equation was that in fact you were just inviting a very different group of people uh, to uh, return. Public housing in, in 1940 in Boston was more selective than MIT. Uh, uh, there were 10,000 applications for 1,000 places uh, in a public housing development uh, when it opened. Um, I think MIT's selectivity has improved since then. But, um, uh, but in any case, uh, it, it was really this kind of uh, sense of moral uplift. Uh, you can't read all the details here, but it says, out of the shadows into the sun, uh, the, nation, the notion of, of back alleys here and then the kind of openness of of public housing, um, and the, the, uh, the, the, the sentence, which is, is, is too good not to, to read to you, uh, says, uh, after, after the war, there were eight shining uh, developments rising fresh to the sun where once in dreary, dirt-filled dilapidation, slum dwellings had shambled in contaminating hopelessness against a gray and somber sky. Uh, in this day, public housing was intended to even fix the weather of Boston. And, you know, it, 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 it really uh, was, was, was there. So this was a period of optimism and openness and opportunity. When people took pictures of public housing projects, they emphasized things like flagpoles and the Bunker Hill Monument at the Charlestown development. Or here uh, in Mission Hill, uh, the Mission Church almost looks like the town church on the common. Uh, and the, 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 the references were all to New England villages. People wanted it. Uh, here in Boston, every one of those circles is a, the site of a post-war uh, housing development where every one of the city councilors said, well, what about Ward 24? We didn't get ours yet. Uh, uh, there, there were 17 of these built after, uh, after the war uh, to complement the eight that were done before. Uh, this, was, this was a desired thing. But note also that the gray areas were the only areas uh, where there was a, a majority non-white population uh, in Boston. Uh, in other words, 23 of these, uh, these developments, or 22 of them, uh, were built in white neighborhoods uh, and intended for white occupancy. Uh, and so some of the, uh, the real challenges for housing has been what do you do as the neighborhoods change uh, and as the population of the town changes uh, when you have done uh, a housing uh, stock like that. 
Uh, it's been a, a real question. But the idea really was uh, that these, these were slum neighborhoods, uh, like that map I showed here. This, is a, this, this map is a close-up of that area of South Boston. And the idea was this was a substandard area uh, known as Census Tract M3. And the idea was it, it just cost too much to the city. There were all of these uh, um, uh, v various kinds of expenses, ranging from uh, street cleaning to, to health costs and that this was a, a lost a net revenue loss. And so the idea was you tear it down and you put something else there and you get uh, other, other people. So you get these dramatic before and after kind of pictures. Uh, that's the same neighborhood. They, they simply drew a little red line that you may be able to barely see, tore down hundreds of places, uh, left the uh, Lithuanian church that was in here but destroyed the entire parish uh, that was around it, uh, and then rebuilt uh, rebuilt public housing for 1,972 units of, of housing uh, and handed it over to Irish-American occupancy. Um, uh, the Lithuanian and Polish communities of South Boston have never forgiven this. Um, uh, so the struggle, though, has been what do you do uh, when, when this stuff uh, starts to decline? And, and I don't have time to give you the whole the whole picture, which is, which is fairly well known, but increasingly you had needier people applying. All of those white, upwardly mobile veterans uh, uh, were given all sorts of other opportunities uh, through various uh, federal initiatives and uh, the way the housing markets were working under the FHA at the time, uh, and increasingly didn't need or want to apply for public housing once the 1950s and, and uh, 60s started. Um, you had people that had, uh, had uh, much less stable employment uh, choosing to apply. The financial system of public housing was premised on the rents covering the occupancy, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, operating expenses, and that was increasingly impossible when you had people bringing in uh, lower incomes. The management failures and the maintenance failures are, are legion, and the design inadequacy of these places that had uh, hundreds and hundreds of children, thousands in some cases, uh, uh, and... Uh, clustered on stairwells and, and reliant on, on uh, unreliable elevators, that sort of thing. Uh, so by the end of the 1970s, in Boston and elsewhere, uh, public housing had uh, declined uh, dramatically. This is the same uh, project in South Boston that I showed just a moment ago, the aerial, uh, where, where nobody really uh, knew what was public, what was private, what was street, what was asphalt for, what was courtyard. Um, uh, this, I think, may have been the last tree, and there are not any tall beavers in South Boston, in case you're, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Um, um, but it, it's the kind of thing that um, uh, was happening. And uh, uh, when I first started visiting, they actually had to annotate the, the, the public street sign to say, private way, dangerous passing. Um, a very sad commentary. Uh, so the question is, well, what do you do about that? Um, uh, the answer in St. Louis, uh, in, uh, famously in the 1970s, was to take the uh, infamous pruitt Igo project and blow it up. Um, uh, the problem, uh, having done that, as the aerial photo of, of St. Louis taken at least uh, 15 years later shows, is that there wasn't anything there to replace it. Uh, this is the open field that is on the site of that that I took about two or three years ago uh, when I went to visit it. There's even been a proposal for a golf course. Um, uh, but it, it's a very, you know, it's a very short-sighted answer. Uh, you know, it, this is the answer that says give up. Uh, but I don't think that's the way to do it. Uh, the current thinking um, is uh, under the uh, federal HOPE 6 program. Uh, it says here, these are some HUD brochures. of. Uh, it says HOPE 6, Building Communities, Transforming Lives, a Promise Fulfilled, uh, the transformations of American public housing. These are all before, after, before, after the, 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 uh, the kind of dramatic transformation. And this one says principles for inner city neighborhood design. Um, the idea uh, being that you tear it all down uh, and you rebuild it as mixed income communities and uh, start all over and try and attract a, a different uh, set of people. Uh, here's a kind of example, again, in St. Louis, uh, the kind of public housing and the housing that's being replaced it. Uh, the catch in all of this is that it's asking a different kind of person to benefit. Um, this is now public housing for those people, uh, the kind of multiracial briefcase set. Um, uh, and, uh, and it's not serving the people that public housing had become uh, in, intended to serve. If you, um, if you actually look at uh, the 
the, the figures, um, it, uh, it's, it's very disturbing about uh, how few very low income people are now going into the redeveloped housing. Um, it's, it's being torn down and then replaced with a different kind of tenant, just like, like what happened in the 1930s and 40s during the slum clearance, uh, when the, the new housing was not intended for those people. Um, uh, so the alternative that, that I've been proposing is what I call reclaiming public housing, uh, which means not just uh, reclaiming uh, the buildings, um, but, but reclaiming the occupancy for very low income people. And so what I did was uh, look at, at places, uh, and I'm just telling you about the most successful of them uh, since time is, is short, um, the, uh, the Commonwealth development uh, in, in Boston, which I think uh, is probably the most successful turnaround of a severely distressed public housing development anywhere in the country, uh, not just uh, here. Uh, when, it, um, uh, when it opened, uh, it was for veterans housing, uh, 650 units uh, here, and a lot of children and a lot of milk trucks. Um, this is 1951. Um, and it had mid-rise buildings and elevators and all of these things that are not supposed to work in public housing. Uh, it worked pretty well uh, for a while. Uh, it opened as an integrated, though barely integrated, development in, in, in the early 50s, which was considered extremely progressive at the, um, at the time, um, and uh, remained a, a, a tolerable place to live into the early 1970s. Um, uh, these fellows, uh, uh, Stephen Brown and John Murphy, were best friends in the early 1970s, and, uh, and a lot of the, uh, the climate managed to miss the, the real tensions over busing that tore apart so much of the other city. But by the end of the 1970s, for all of these reasons that I mentioned, uh, uh, Commonwealth uh, declined uh, dramatically. Um, by 1980, it was 52% vacant. Uh, only 14% of the households uh, had... Uh, employment, full-time employment. 94% uh, of the households were headed by a single female. Uh, only 11% of the people when, when interviewed said they felt very safe. Um, the judge who put the Boston Housing Authority in receivership in 1980 uh, said that the development was regarded by neighbors with fear and loathing, were his words. Um, when people moved out, as they did often without notice, uh, no one was able to secure the apartments. They were vandalized and then proved un unrentable, so you ended up uh, things like, with things like this. Um, and you ended up with the, the kind of uh, picture that, that characterized the, the top uh, of this, uh, which is just at the beginning of the efforts to uh, reconstruct it. Uh, but people didn't give up, nor did they give it over to wealthier uh, people. Uh, what happened was a transformation uh, from this plan to this, which may look very similar except for the color to you, but note uh, a couple of things. Instead of that building here is a daycare center, Instead of that building here is a management center and a com uh, community center. And instead of these buildings separate, they're connected over here uh, uh, in a special complex of housing to serve needs of the elderly. Um, and another road was put through here so it didn't just seem like a single loop uh, through it. Um, uh, the, the tenant leadership was crucial. Uh, this man, Bart McDonough, uh, was the tenant leader at the time uh, at the opening of the child care center uh, here. Uh, and they did a fabulous job of, of organizing themselves and working with, uh, with people to assert their needs, especially their right to return uh, to the redeveloped uh, place. Uh, the, the design, um, it's a little hard to, to read the one on the, uh, on the left, but uh, what they did was they turned, uh, high turned three-story buildings that had had apartments on each floor into townhouse-type things um, so that when somebody was on a stoop, they could actually uh, talk to somebody on the street. And it really uh, transformed the design into something much closer to uh, a, uh, a normal streetscape. Uh, and they landscaped it uh, beautifully. Uh, as much as 10 feet of fill was put in here. And it became a place where people had a sense of what was private and what was semi-private and where the public realm was. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, they turned it over to a, a, a very first-rate private management team. Uh, that, that occupied part of this building along with the tenant, uh, tenant offices. And it got to a point where a place that had been considered so dangerous that nobody would go near it in the late 1970s, by the mid-1980s, they had to erect resident parking-only signs uh, because uh, there were people from the suburbs that were coming and parking 
on site at Commonwealth Development and then getting on the green line to commute the rest of their way uh, to their jobs. Um, it's just a remarkable kind of transformation of a neighborhood and of an attitude uh, done uh, by this, this uh, tremendous uh, kind of, of thing. Um, it's ultimately, I think, a function of community. This was a sign I saw in the community center that some of the kids had put together. Welcome to our community room, rules. No cussing, fighting, jumping on tables, groping, stealing, ball playing, drinking, smoking, throwing, spitting, teasing, or running. Warning, uh, one warning, then you must leave on, on number two. Um, this, was a, this was an effort to restore community uh, in a place that, uh, that was done so without a loss to uh, a commitment to extremely low income people. Uh, the redevelopment uh, succeeded in fostering safety and reliability and quality management and attractive conditions uh, without replacing the population uh, with a, a less needy group. Um, I wish it were the national model, um, but it isn't. Um, instead, a, uh, a recent study of the $5 billion federal program known as HOPE-6, uh, uh, some of you saw the Globe yesterday. It, it was a, a big discussion of it uh, on page three. Um, the, the program that's known as HOPE-6, H-O-P-E-6, uh, -E um, found that only 11% of those who had lived in the neighborhoods that were uh, in severely distressed public housing um, that were being replaced by the HOPE-6 program actually got back into the redeveloped housing or the um, or slated to do so. In other words, it's that same kind of 10% people get back uh, that we noticed in the 30s and, and 40s. Um, so I don't make any friends at HUD when I suggest that the HOPE acronym really ought to stand for House Our Poor People Elsewhere. Um, um, uh, let me uh, briefly conclude then by uh, returning to this question of ethics. Um, I begin with a few words about methodology and about the need to address the power relations uh, that are inherent in studying our, our fellow human beings. Um, but clearly, the ethical challenge in this kind of work is really a double one. Um, it's not just a matter of method, but also of content. Um, in terms of content, we really have to remember that the entire field of housing is infused with moral judgments. Uh, each of us, consciously or not, is, is making moral judgments about a person based on where he or she lives. Um, and to, to study public housing is about making societal, uh, studying societal, ju societal judgments about the, the place of poor people in cities. Um, so really, at base, I'm interested in the history of public housing, not just because it tells us so much about who we were and who we are, uh, but because it helps us explain and inform uh, action in the present. Uh, that sentence alone is probably enough to keep me from ever having a joint appointment in a history department. But, um, but it's really an essential perspective to have um, for someone interested in urban planning. Um, my field takes, uh, entails taking action in the world, uh, building theory out of a close observation of practice. Ours is really a never-ending kind of search to make sense out of the messiest parts of the world. And I thank you for letting me share part of my search with you this morning. Stay there. Yep, stay, stay there. You can stay right there. All right. Uh, we now come to the uh, participation part of the program. Uh, we're going to start here and sort of work our way across with uh, questions. Uh, there is the prevalent feeling that without an individual's investment in his own residence, there won't be the company responsibility for upkeep. Is there any validity to that? Um, I think there, uh, there is. I, um, I showed one of my uh, graduate students uh, yesterday a, the slide about rent, uh, about Brown and his match scratching uh, uh, as a renter, and she says, well, I was a homeowner in New Haven, and now I'm a renter in, in Boston, and I don't want to do anything for this landlord that's got uh, my place. I mean, that's an anecdote. But uh, the interesting thing from uh, my work, and I didn't show uh, the images today, is looking at what people were doing in these redeveloped places with the area immediately outside of their apartments. It used to be that public housing was often, uh, it, there was a real split between uh, the beautiful upkeep of the interior of the apartment and then disaster the moment you stepped out the door into the hallways and all of that. But in these more successfully redeveloped places, uh, what you find is that people are taking uh, control over some of the, 
the semi-public space immediately outside the area, whether it's an interior of the building or outside. And, and people are doing gardens and veg vegetable, uh, vegetable gardens and flowers. And that um, when, when people have a sense of security about their environment, I find that they're taking some personal investment in it. So I'm sure that what you say is absolutely true. But, but when you restore some stability and security and good management, um, I think that people respect that and respond accordingly. Here. Uh, if there are low income requirements for occupying housing, how can this not then have a negative effect on a family's ambition to advance economically? Well, um, w one of the, uh, th there have been a number of um, measures taken recently on that. Um, uh, it used to be that the, 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 the problem was that people advanced so quickly that they were kicked out of public housing in the, in the uh, early days because it, it didn't, uh, uh, they, they would go over income. Uh, now, uh, because there's some interest in maintaining uh, some of the, the more stable earning families, there are ceiling rents uh, so that after a certain point you don't have to pay uh, a portion of your uh, uh, the 30% of your rent to remain, and that that will encourage some people to uh, remain uh, and diversify the community by, by incomes. Um, uh, so uh, it, 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 is, it is certainly a, a problem, and I think the, the, the goal for any good community ought to be that there are some people uh, who, who become lifelong residents and other people who, who last there only a short while and then move onward and upward to something else. Uh, and the, the hope is that people will, will not have to be sending the next generation uh, through public housing. And the interesting thing about Commonwealth, where, where, where the unemployment rate is still very high, is that they have a much higher percentage of the younger people going on to college uh, than other public housing in Boston. And, and it seems to me that by stabilizing the environment, uh, there, are, there are new opportunities for the next generation that might not otherwise have happened. Is there a question in this section over here? Uh, the three that, uh, that I wrote uh, about were all, all in Boston, uh, the Alston-Brighton area uh, where Commonwealth is, uh, South Boston, and uh, Dorchester, uh, and particular developments within them, the other two being uh, uh, West Broadway, or known as D Street in South Boston, and Franklin Field along Blue Hill Avenue uh, in Dorchester. Uh, and I found that there was almost as much diversity within a single city as there would be if I had done a more uh, nationally comparative kind of study, I think. In the next section over. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what? What? How much success uh, does success depend on a single charismatic individual? Um, I don't think that there was a single charismatic individual at um, at the Commonwealth success. Um, what there was was a, uh, a nurturing of, of ability for tenants to speak, to speak outward uh, about what was really bothering them and people who were initially not terribly effective in, in public settings uh, gained that kind of confidence. Um, but it was a process that was really cast with stars for every role. I mean, people from the housing authority, from the community organizer, from the designer, uh, from the management company, um, I don't think it was necessarily charisma, but it sure was a whole lot of competence. Let's see if we can take the last question with the microphone over there. Uh, how do you see the role of private affordable housing developers such as Habitat for Humanity? Um, there, there is a, such a crying need for low-income housing provision that everybody uh, from all sectors needs to, to pitch in. Um, what I would observe, however, is that nearly all of, the, the, of what comes out of either private or nonprofit sectors has failed to reach those who are most at risk. Uh, the million people that are on housing authority waiting lists around the country often have incomes uh, that are so low, uh, either through lack of employment or minimum wage uh, uh, kinds of jobs, uh, often multiple minimum wage jobs where they can't afford to live in the cities that they are. And my fear is that, that most of what goes on 
um, either through, through Habitat or through uh, the Community Development Corporation world, or even a lot of the housing that's funded by low-income housing tax credits, uh, which can go up to 60% of median income, is simply not reaching uh, the people who are at 15% of, of median income that are in public housing. So if you lose your spot in public housing, and that's happened to 115,000 uh, units that have been torn down by the federal government during uh, the last uh, decade or so, uh, you don't have an alternative. Uh, we are going backwards on the question of provision of housing for very low-income people, and I find that to be very disturbing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. That's great. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Stephen Ensibelair. Uh, he is a faculty member in the Department of Political Science. He was a Carnegie Scholar. He won the Goldsmith Book Prize for Going Negative, How Political Advertising Divides and Shrinks the American Electorate. And he's been a national fellow at the Hoover Institution. I have to tell you, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, as he doesn't know my congressman is Chris Shays. And I know Chris fairly well, and we've had conversations about this subject. And I am, at the moment, candidate for first selectman in my community, which is sort of like being mayor, only you don't have any power. And I'm looking forward to either going negative or not going negative, depending on how things uh, work out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to, to take notes. And with that, Dr. Ansel Bear. Thank, Thank you. you. This is uh, my, uh, the book Going Negative was written in, published in 96, and this project that I'm going to talk about today is really a follow-on to that, because the question coming out of the study of political advertising in the 90s that I did and that others did was whether or not television and the demand uh, for money to pay for political advertising is having corrupting effects, and that's where Chris Shays comes into this. And this project is really about a transformation of my own thinking, and I suspect a transformation of other people's thinking on this issue. And it's really at the intersection of law and politics and economics um, where this uh, research is located. And let me tell you a little bit about that transformation, which is that Going into this project, my assessment, my thinking, my beliefs um, were that television advertising costs were driving political campaign expenditures, along with corruption, the things you had to promise as a politician in order to raise money. Um, and the transformation gradually, and a lot of the facts were right underneath my nose the entire time going into this, the transformation really came out of an understanding that money is more, uh, money in our society uh, is more about participation, um, and that raises a different set of problems. And so I want to sort of talk you around to that um, and get you to the point where I hope you understand at least where I'm coming from, and maybe you even agree with me by the end of this. Let me begin with um, a famous equality uh, in uh, this area of thinking, which is money is speech. Now, to most of us, we can think of some immediate problems with this equation, but this is the legal view in the United States. Money is speech. Um, and this came out of a famous court case called Buckley v. Vallejo in 1976, where the Supreme Court made that equation. Um, and before then, it really had never made that equation. Money is speech in this perspective in two ways. One is, if you're a political candidate or an organization or even an individual, who wants to spend money to uh, promote an idea, to campaign for office, the government cannot force you to um, limit the amount of speech that you want to engage in. It can't arbitrarily or uh, uh, um, unilaterally limit the total campaign spending in the United States. And that was what um, the court threw out, which was a provision in the original Federal Elections Campaign Act, limiting the amount of money that congressional candidates spent for elections. In addition, the court decided that um, giving was a kind of speech. If you give money to somebody, you're supporting them, you're endorsing them. 
However, they didn't, the court didn't go quite as far in uh, their view that money is speech with respect to giving because they said that there was also a government interest in limiting corruption. And against that government interest, we had to weigh our, our views of how we regulate contributions behavior. It's a difficult, con it's a, it's a difficult line to draw, um, and it's what's before the Supreme Court right now. Because last year, um, the McCain-Feingold bill passed, and that was to limit other kinds of campaign um, spending and contributions. And that raises, once again, this thorny set of issues, which we seem to be continually thinking our way through. From a social scientist's perspective, one question we should qu ask is, is money speech? And there's been a variety of research on this, set of laboratory experiments, which is what I did in my earlier work, um, relating the advertising that one sees to whether or not one supports a candidate whose advertisements you saw. And there, uh, in the laboratory, you can produce a pretty big effect of seeing just one political advertisement. There have also been a set of field experiments done at, U done at Yale where they've sent people out into the fields, they've gotten campaigns to agree to do this, where they randomly choose who's going to get direct mailings and who's not, who's going to receive a canvasser and who's not. And it looks like it costs about $40 to persuade somebody to vote. Um, hard to say if it's whether or not they'll vote for you. And then there are what are called observational studies, just correlating how much is spent with how well you do in the election. And that seems to suggest something on the order of if you double your spending, say from $250,000 to $500,000, you can increase your vote share in a congressional campaign by about five percentage points. So there does seem to be this connection between money and speech, though I'm not sure I would call it an equality. I think there's a fundamental ethical and societal set of problems that we need to think about and that the court's really thinking about right now. And that is that everyone benefits from free speech in our society. Everyone benefits from campaign finance, all of us. Why? Because the fact that the candidate can go out and advertise means that they're creating a more informed electorate, and that's a public good. So anybody who votes can get information. Otherwise, it's very difficult to become informed about what the choices are that face you in a primary, in a primary election especially, but in a candidate contest or in a, in a in an initiative or referendum. However, and this is the, where the difficulty comes in, private financing of political campaigns, which is the way almost every advanced democracy works, um, make politicians more attuned to the interests of donors. And that's where the difficulty lies. As a societal problem, and I want to distinguish a societal problem from a legal or ethical problem, as a societal problem, the question is how do we weigh the gain that we all get from having competitive, informative elections against the idea that maybe the people who give money in some ways are getting more weight in the society. And we'll come back to how that might work. There is a set of individual ethical problems which have to do with the individual relationship between the specific donor and the politician, which we might call bribery, and we um, uh, will maintain bribery law throughout, no matter what the court decides about the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, versus personal speech. Because if I'm an individual politician or I'm an individual um, in a society, I want to have my speech, and my money is my speech. Well, the US, after Buckley v. Vallejo, still regulates political campaigns, and we regulate it in a couple of ways. The Federal Elections Campaign Act set down contribution limits on individuals and groups and parties. And if you're an individual, you can give $1,000 in election because there's a primary and a general election. That means that in an election cycle, you can give $2,000 to a federal candidate. You can get a group, like a corporation that has a political action committee, can give up to $10,000 to a candidate. And parties have a different set of limits, but they're roughly comparable. In presidential campaigns, we have public financing. We have two kinds of public financing. In the primary election, we have matching funds, which has all sorts of interesting implications. You have to, every, any candidate who raises a certain amount of money can have that money matched. Um, in the general election, we have public financing that's just an outright grant. And to either qualify for the grant or for the matching funds, you have to abide by spending limits. And this is the only way that the court's been willing to allow spending limits. In addition, an individual or a group can spend independently, and that's what are called issue ads. You can go out and buy as many issue ads as you want advocating a particular issue. 
Um, and parties can spend money in the state elections because they're no longer federal elections, and that's called soft money. That's what the McCain-Feingold law went after, those two issues. The big question that everyone's wondering about right now is, is the Federal Election Campaign Act failing? Is this system that was set up in 1974 about to fall apart and so we're going to go into an unregulated system? In 2000 election, we spent about $3 billion on federal elections. That's every dollar I've been able to uncover from any sort of odd loophole and so forth. Um, it's roughly evenly divided in the U.S. between congressional candidates who spend about a billion dollars, and that's all within the limits. It's all legal money, no, no loopholes. Um, parties who spent almost another billion, a little over another billion, most of which was hard money. That's legal. That's under, under those contribution limits. And then finally, the presidential system, of which only about $240 million came from the public treasury and $500 million came from private sources. And here's the real problem that people point to, which is this is the trend in campaign spending relative to inflation since 1880 in the United States. And this is presidential. I've been able to accumulate a series of presidential expenditures. And that's this graph with little dots on it going up. And it looks like the system is about to come apart because the trend is going up extremely fast. This is, since 1974, we've had some accounting of what Congress spends, and Congress is going up as well. And these are political action committees. These are interest groups. The worry then is that even with these regulations, we're not able to control campaign spending and the resulting issues of corruption. So the fundamental question that political scientists and economists are grappling with right now is, why is spending growing? Why is campaign spending growing? And um, I just want to say it parenthetically, this is not an American problem either. Every democracy that we've been able to study and uh, every, every state is witnessing the same problems. Campaign spending growing, apparently, without bound. So the first thing that um, social scientists have been looking at since the 70s is corruption. Is there a smoking gun out there? Is there a relationship between donors giving money to legislators and legislators voting? And the answer is, if it's out there, it's extremely rare. Um, so there we, um, we've surveyed uh, over 200 studies that have been published, and only one in five of those studies report any significant correlation. And once you control for the district's interest, in other words, the legislators, the people the legislator represents, their interest, there's no connection between the donations they get and how they behave in legislation, either making decisions uh, in a roll call vote or in terms of final passage of legislation. What about TV? This is probably the thing that surprised me most in this investigation. Um, this is uh, total campaign spending challengers and incumbents combined in different congressional elections. And what we've done is grouped quintiles of expenditures of districts. So this is the cost of airing ads in congressional elections. The fifth quintile is New York and LA. You pay $1,100 per rating point in, in LA. The lowest quintile is like Alabama and Montana. You pay $62 per quintile. There's no correlation between the cost of the rating point and how much is spent, which is when we saw this, sort of stopped us, in our, stopped a lot of researchers in their tracks because this means that total campaign expenditures are unrelated to TV costs. Um, now, this is uh, for Chris Shays. This is um, a, a pressing issue in the future because the next piece of campaign legislation that John McCain is sponsoring is to give candidates free airtime and to regulate campaign price, uh, TV advertising prices to try to control campaign spending. And the lesson here is this has nothing to do with the rise of campaign spending or the demand for interest group money. Why is this true? Well, this is best, best seen in a little graph. This graph shows those quintiles along the bottom. This is the most expensive market. And this is the cheapest market. And this is the percent that candidates are spending on TV and on direct mail. Uh, campaigns are like little efficient firms. 
if you face a very expensive input price, you substitute into a near substitute. And in this case, it's direct mail. So as TV goes down, as you get in more expensive media market, and direct mail goes up. Um, and there are other kinds of campaign um, uh, communications. But the price or cost push inflation doesn't really seem to bear out very strongly. The model that social scientists seem to be concentrating more on now is one in which we believe that, it's, that giving is a form of political participation. Even giving by corporations is a form of political participation. Um, there have been some excellent surveys of who gives why and how much. And it looks like a fairly constant fraction of the United States public has been giving to politics for the last 25 to 30 years for which we have survey data. And that constant fraction is about 8%. 8% of the American public gives money to political candidates. Those 8% tend to be drawn disproportionately from the upper income quintile. In other words, the wealthiest quintile gives about 12, about 12 people from the wealthiest quintile give for every person who's in the lower and middle income quintile. So we have a fairly constant participation rate. Um, when we study um, state elections to get a little more leverage on what explains the growth in campaign spending, we find that two things come out. One is income per capita strongly predicts how much is spent in gubernatorial elections and the closeness of the election, so the demand for money. The size of government is not related to um, how much is spent, and this is sort of something that's predicted by economists who think that government is, um, it, there's a lot of corruption or a lot of extortion that underlies campaign spending, and therefore you'd expect that the size of government would explain the, so the amount of money that was spent. In fact, it seems to be more of just two things, income per capita and the closeness of elections. And I think the, the main surprising thing that we've uh, uncovered, and this is uh, my collaborators here at, at MIT, is that when you take that same time trend of how much is spent in U.S. elections and deflate it by not inflation, which is the purchasing power of the dollar, but GDP, which is how much income there is in the society, you find that since the 1940s, roughly, there's been really no change in how much is spent in U.S. elections. Spending grows with income. Um, what changed is this era is a lot different from what came after it. And that era was the era of political party machineries in the cities, uh, the robber barons, and so forth. This is a very different political era than this era out here. And from this perspective, it does not look like after the Federal Elections Campaign Act, which is this line right here, 1974, there's any trend at all in how much spending is growing. Spending just grows with how much income there is in the society. Um, we've gone out and looked at uh, several other countries, England, uh, Sweden, uh, Italy, all of them show the same pattern. Income is a constant fraction, uh, campaign spending is a constant fraction of the society. This takes us back to the fundamental question, I think, is before the court right now today, and the fundamental question that really motivated my own interest in this, in this problem, which is, is there a societal problem lurking behind the campaign finance question that really the United States has debated since 1905? There are two ways to view the societal problem. One is that campaign finance reflects the purchase of private benefits for corporations and wealthy individuals at the public trough? And the answer seems to be no. The, the donations from corporations, donations from labor unions, donations from in wealthy individuals are not buying private benefits, such as a specific tax loophole, um, at least to any significant amount. And I think the, the most stunning way to think about this is the amounts that I've shown you are actually trivially small. $3 billion as a fraction of government spending is nothing. $3 billion as a fraction of our national income is nothing. And if we imagine that what was going on was the sale of private benefits, which is the usual picture, I think, that people have in their minds 
when they think about campaign contributions, especially from corporations and, um, and wealthy individuals, then those private benefits would be exclusive little benefits that you could buy, say a, a subsidy for an industry. If that were going on, then you'd have a nice little natural market, and this would be um, probably the best market to invest in in America, because the rate of return would have to be enormous um, on $3 billion for this to amount to any amount of um, societal problem. So uh, if you believe that you can buy significant private benefits, I have one little recommendation for you, which is to take your money out of the stock market and um, invest in a politician. However, we've seen very little of that kind of behavior. Um, there's a second societal problem, and uh, it has to do with public policy. And that is that the fact that you have a system of campaign finance which draws disproportionately on wealthy individuals means that the wealthy individuals might have more weight in the society. In a, in a sense, campaign finance might be thought of differently as weighted voting. Think back to the one figure I told you, which is it costs about $40 to mobilize someone to vote. So if I gave $2,000, or if I even gave $100, I'd be worth two and a half votes by that equation. If I give, so the amount that I get is and somehow translating not into speech as the courts originally um, defined it, but maybe it's translating into votes. And if that's the case, then we have a different sort of problem on our hands, one that the courts have not really grappled with, and that is the idea that we have, the, we have to weigh the issue of weighted voting, how much weight individuals in our society have in a participatory model of politics or a pluralistic society, and whether that sort of behavior reflects the kind of representation we want. That is not the question that the court has put before us, but it is the question that's sort of lurking out there. And this is the direction in which we're taking uh, this research at MIT, and that is now not to look at a set of small private benefits that individual firms might get, um, but to look at the overall tax code, and whether the overall tax code is more or less progressive or regressive. It appears, so from, this is very preliminary, uh, it appears that there is a, a small but noticeable fact of campaign giving in the states on the progressivity of the tax code to the tune of about a half a percentage point. In other words, the, poor, the, the rate that the upper income people pay, pay in terms of their ta income taxes is about half percent lower as a result of about a dollar increase in per capita spending in the states. I want to end there and just sort of throw this open for um, some questions, uh, mainly because whenever I sort of talk about this to a public forum, the fundamental, the, the fundamental facts seem to be uh, a bit jarring, and I'd like to just hear what, what you all have to say about the nature of um, money in American system, in our American political system, and whether or not um, this is something we need to fundamentally reform at this point. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, let's see if we can start on the far side of the room and uh, work our way back over here. Wait for the microphone, because otherwise the people on the outside can't hear you. Uh, uh, I came 3,000 miles from California, and I would suggest that if you did your next five studies in California, that your corruption thing would balance out if you find four cases. Um, <laughs> where a meeting with the governor, there is actually a price tag for a meeting. Uh, however, uh, of a more serious nature, uh, what about the money that union members pay uh, as individuals to the union, and then they, for instance, in California, the teachers' union is the largest single contributor by millions of dollars over anybody else, and they have managed to centralize all public education in Sacramento and remove local control, and the result has been disastrous for public education. Um, let me talk about the price of a meeting first. Um, Terry McAuliffe um, uh, uh, said at a meeting that I was at that um, you know, there's a price schedule for the time of the president. This was referring to Clinton. Um, you know, if you, you can get a photo for $10,000 with a group. You can get a photo at your table for $25,000, so forth. So it, it is the case that money is used to regulate politicians' time, especially the more um, prominent individuals. 
Whether that gets you anything in return privately is a different matter and a pretty substantially different matter. And there's just extremely hard to find any evidence of, of instances of corruption that go beyond small scale bribery, um, right? Like uh, Kim in California is a, a classic case. Um, union members are, um, and for which we have bribery laws and they're pretty effective. Um, Union members are an interesting other issue, and that is classically what I'm talking about. That's taking a bunch of individuals who are participating through their membership in the union and pooling their resources. The same is true of a, a corporation in the United States. A political action committee is not, money, is not siphoning money out of the corporate treasury. They're raising money in, from individuals within the firm. So it's a way of pooling resources. Um, the union members, though, tend to be middle and lower income, and they are, their donations are outnumbered, I said, 12 to 1 by wealthy individual participation. Um, what the effect of teachers' unions are on public education and so forth, that seems to be a, 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 that's an, another um, topic. I don't think that their power, however, comes from their money. I think their power comes from the fact that they're organized, and they can walk out on strikes, and that has a much bigger effect on negotiations and wages, and the NLRB protects them, um, and so forth. So there are other, the union brings so many other resources to bear on the, that that's what's explaining their effectiveness in terms of public policy. Let's see if we can come back to this side. I'm, I'm curious as how do you draw the connection between uh, the, the income tax and the wealth of donors, the income tax changes? Um, there are a couple of interesting case studies of the Tax Reform Act of 86, um, where what was um, at stake in the Tax Reform Act was whether we should eliminate a bunch of corporate loopholes and lower the marginal tax rate or keep the marginal tax rate on uh, the upper income uh, seg segments of the society high and keep those loopholes. And in the end, when push came to shove, it was lowering the income tax rate rather than the, keeping the corporate loopholes, which is an interesting statement. And, and there was a lot of evidence about the lobbying. So once people got in the door, what did the firms in the end lobby for? They lobbied for lowering the personal income tax rate rather than keeping the private benefits for the corporation. So it's one piece of interesting evidence, and, and there are other bills that are have the similar flavor where corporations, when push comes to so shove, prefer to pr pursue their income classes' um, interests. The immediate studies I was referring to here take the broad panel of, um, of uh, tax rates in the states and relate that to the total amount of spending in those states over time within states. So when you see a change in campaign spending over time, say a five-year interval, do you see a shift in the income tax um, subsequently? Uh, and you do. And then when there are other pieces to look at, such as Florida and a few other states in, in Minnesota introduced public financing. Once you remove the private money, what happens? In those states, you saw an increase in progressivity of the tax code. So there, we're attacking this from a bunch of different angles, uh, one from the observational or aggregate data, and then also from some, some sort of more focus case studies. If you have any thoughts on um, what to do, let me know. Come in here. I taught MIT. The only school that gave an SP degree compared to the university. Give him the mic. Use the mic. Use the mic. I thought MIT was the only school that gave an SB degree. Apparently, the University of Minnesota does also. Yeah, but at Minnesota, it's a BS. <laughs> Minnesota's a Bachelor of Science, so it's a BS. <laughs> Instead of SB. Use the mic. The gentleman uh, with the, uh, his hand up there. I find your results very interesting, but I can't wrap my mind around, I can't come to believe it yet. And I, and I think the following way, what if the advocates of low income housing 
had as much money to spend as the advocates of um, any uh, uh, income tax cut or, or tax break like the petroleum industry had to spend, wouldn't they be a lot more successful than they are now? Uh, if you gave, if you equalize the amount of money that was given as a matter of participation, then yeah, they probably would be because that's a matter of weighted voting. However, it, when you start looking at how much corporations give, it is remarkably small. The average corporate contribution to a candidate, to, to an incumbent, is $1,700, which is, a, 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 in the scheme of things, a, a tiny amount. Um, corporations total gave, in this entire picture, all that money, $3 billion. Corporations total, in terms of their, their hard money gave, giving, and there's a giving to Congress, was $300 million. So of the billion dollars that Congress gave, corporations gave a small amount. And I suspect that that in and of itself means that corporations see this as not a great investment in the scheme of things. It's a small fraction of corporate revenues. Um, if we equalize spending by not, not giving it to a group of public housing advocates, I think they would be as effective as a corporation in their, in their ability to get things. But if we equalize spending across income groups, then I think we would see some changes. We have a question over on this side. Following up with the, with the question of equalizing over income groups, what would uh, be your, your response to uh, making any kind of private contribution or corporate contribution completely illegal and having the government uh, finance all campaigns as a public collective good, just like it does for national defense? Um, I'll, I'll put the national defense issue aside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't want to get in trouble with Chuck. Um, so uh, the, uh, we do public fi publicly finance general elections for president. Um, and um, so there is some degree of that already, and we've, seen, we've, we've had an experience with that. And the problem is it's very difficult to implement a public financing scheme without things leaking through leap, loopholes um, or to find their way through another organizational scheme. If we were to do something like that, I think you'd have to be extremely generous. Basically, you'd have to buy people out. So there's, to, to re completely remove the incentive for them to misbehave in any way. Um, and when, that con when, you, when you propose a very generous system like that, the public just doesn't go for it. Massachusetts just went through a five-year struggle over this, and let me briefly characterize it. In 1998, we passed a, an initiative which was to create a publicly financed electoral system. The advocates of that system knew in advance that there was no way that they could do that pass that and tie it to any kind of financing scheme, like a tax that you'd put in, like a tax checkoff. So they left that off, and that passed pretty substantially. When That meant that the legislature had to pass a, a financing scheme. And when the legislature sat down to pass a financing scheme, they, they just couldn't do it. There was just too much opposition within the Democratic Party in particular to finance the Republican opponents. Um, and this system failed. So the Supreme Court of the state eventually had to get involved in this issue, and their level of involvement was down to ordering the sale of the furniture of the Speaker of the House to pay for the system. Right? So the opponents of this system put an advisory initiative on this, on the, on the, um, to the public in 2002, and that advisory opinion was, if we use taxpayer dollars to pay for public pay publicly for elections, would you support it? And that, won that lost overwhelmingly, two-thirds, two three-quarters um, against using taxpayer money. So the issue is the public will not go for it. They, they do, people do not like the idea of using taxpayer dollars to pay for elections. Um, and I think that's where we are. I'm sorry. I, th I think we're going to stop there. We, we need to take a break. I, this is a, a subject that uh, we could all have fun with, but standing here, it's making me extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> all these sort of, the, uh, the underlying tone of this is politicians are corrupt.
Is there gambling in Las Vegas? <laughs> no, that's fixed. Uh. <laughs> All right. So, they, I would, by the way, I was a, an aeronautical engineer as an undergraduate here, and when the newspaper found that out, the headline said, rocket scientist runs for first selectman. Was... <laughs> so, with that, uh, we're going to take a break. There are refreshments out in the, the lobby. Uh, we'd like to have you back at 11 so that we can uh, continue to stay on schedule and get you off to lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give you a second to it's okay. She asked me if she needs a lab. Uh, she will speak briefly just before lunch, but she can probably speak she here. Speak. Yeah. So are we up? Uh, yeah. All right. This says John F. Bennett. Yes, it does. 1930. F. Distinguish this guy from that guy over there that's alive. I assume it does, yes. I was introduced to him as being John Bennett. Yeah. Say yeah, I don't know. I these I don't know those okay. people. Bonnie didn't know. This is, this okay. Is in the MIT, uh, ah, the memorial MIT. service. Yes, I saw that. Okay, we'll find out. All right, welcome back. If you'll uh, take your seats, we can get restarted. This is always the hard part, getting the enthusiastic uh, conversation to come to an end, but we'd like to get started again if we can. Thank you. Thank you. I had the opportunity to uh, try to settle down a crowd about this size once a couple of years ago. Uh, then, then past President Ford was about to speak, and uh, I was standing at the podium like this trying to get the crowd to settle down, and they weren't nearly as helpful as you were. They kept right on talking and talking. And, Finally, he, the Secret Service man who was standing just to my side sidled up to me and said, would you like me to fire off a couple of shots? <laughs> Which apparently is Secret Service humor. I don't... Uh, <laughs> this, was, this was a few years ago. It probably wouldn't have crossed his mind today. Uh, well, our next speaker is Dr. Rudolf Janisch who is going to talk with us about mammalian cloning and stem cell therapy problems and promise. Uh, Dr. Yanish is uh, a distinguished member of the faculty and a founding member of the Whitehead Institute, and uh, I encourage you to look at the material in the booklet. Uh, not much more can be said than that. That institution, in combination with MIT, has led some of the most astonishing research in the last decade. So without further ado, Dr. Yanish.
Thank you very much. I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about something very different from what you heard this morning. So what I'd like to do is to talk about some biological issues which are um, revolve around Dolly, the first mammalian animal cloned by nuclear transfer. It's about now six years ago. And when Dolly was reported, this raised a number of quite interesting issues. One issue which I find still totally surprising is why does it work in the first place sometimes? I think um, mammalian cloning raises other questions. What is the usefulness of this technology for research, for medicine, for medical application, for biotech industry? And then maybe the most uh, controversial um, issue is should we use this technology um, for human um, and applications? So I want to really, in the, in the next 30 minutes or so, really address some aspects of these three questions, mostly from a biological point of view. So we know cloning works. We know this from the Raelians, and this is Rael, the leader of this sect of Raelians, who knows that life came from, uh, by cloning from another star. He is in front of his UFO, and this is Bishop Bossolier, who is the CEO of CloneAid, who would know by the day, by the week, clone people. Healthy people are getting so boring that even the press doesn't mind anymore. And there's another aspect of this, um, um, uh, of this sect which makes them probably interesting to many. Anyway, <laughs> Rail, Rail is a very imaginative uh, guy. He got his ideas um, in 1970 when he was abducted by a UFO in the Pyrenees. And then he got it. And so he had very um, imaginative things to say actually after September 11, which I really can't resist to show you what he said then. What he said is human cloning will make terrorist attacks inefficient and will allow the judgment of the perpetrators. <laughs> so Af, he said, we must accelerate development of human cloning technology because it will make terrorist attacks inefficient in the future. Indeed, when phase three of cloning will be reached, the one which allows direct cloning of an adult, thanks to this growth process, will be followed by regular downloading, personality, memory, and experience to your PC. <laughs> Therefore, when tragedy occurs, this information, what primitive people used to call the soul, could be transferred to the new clone. So you would lose one day. <laughs> when, if you... But this is even more important. This technology would allow also the cloning of terrorists, thus allowing us to try them for their crimes. <laughs> this way, no suicidal attack would, would see its perpetrator escape from justice through death. So, what you have to do is you have to identify the terrorist before he does it, Clo make several copies. One can go to jail, one go on death row, whatever you want to do. So it's obviously a very imaginative way of this technology. So let me come to the issues. What is, what is cloning? So there are two types of cloning. One is molecular cloning, when you take a human gene, for example, and multiply it in a bacterium. We know this since the 70s. It's a very important technology. Animal cloning in a sense, is the carbon copy, a genetic carbon copy of an indi individual. So it has identical genes as a donor. Let me contrast the difference between the conventional way of reproduction and cloning. So in the conventional way, you know that um, in the parents, there's a genetic exchange between the two chromosomes they inherited from their parents. This is called meiosis. As a result of this, every sibling has a different combination of genes which were present in the parents. So every sibling is a new and genetically unique life um, which will not exist, has not existed before and will never exist again. In cloning, one takes cells of one of these individuals and now generates new individuals, which of course all identical. There's no meiosis, no sperm or egg maturation. So these clones are all identical. There's no novel gene combination. It's really the propagation of existing life. From the biological point of view, it is not new life. I think that's important to, to realize. I will come back to this. So cloning has enormous problems. It is extremely inefficient. The major problem is what we call epigenetic regulation. Let me define what it is. So Dolly was made from a cell of a mammary gland. So these nuclei of such a cell are poised to express the genes which are important for mammary gland function, let's say milk production, but not the genes which are important for embryonic development. They are there, but they are silenced. So 
What in cloning has to occur after the nucleus is put into the egg, this adult pattern of gene expression has to be converted to some which is appropriate for an embryonic one. This is not a genetic change. It's called epigenetic because it doesn't involve any change in sequence. So they give me a very simple, so I know that's a little bit for many of you, you will not appreciate what that means. Let me tell you in a very simple example what I mean. And this is a text example. So you know this first paragraph, you to be or not to be, that is the question, and so on. You can read this very easily because there are spaces between the words, their punctuation, and so on and so forth. Let's make an experiment. Let's take out all the spaces and all the punctuation. Now try to read the sentence. It's much more difficult. This is exactly what epigenetic does. It makes genes readable to the cell or non-readable. There's no change in information content, the same information content. So development occurs by making some of these genes, some of these sentences, readable. Let's say in the mammary gland, the genes for milk production are readable, but the ones for embryonic development are not. In the early embryo, those genes are not readable, but those are. So the problem of Dolly, of cloning, is how you convert this epigenetic state or this state of the genes to one which is appropriate for the early embryo. This probably goes over some of those, over those um, stages. So I could put molecular terms on this, what I mean with this, but I think that gives you the idea. So the problem of Dolly then was that the donor cell expressed the genes which is important for mammary gland function, let's say those for production of milk, but not those which the early embryo needs. So they, the transplanted nucleus, must therefore activate those genes and inactivate the other ones. And that's why it's the main reason that this procedure is extremely inefficient and the outcome is almost always detrimental, not normal. So this is the procedure. So in normal fertilization, two gametes, a sperm and an egg, they're called haploid because they're only the half the set of genes, are combined to give rise to what's called a diploid zygote or early embryo. Genes come from father and from mother. In cloning, one removes the nucleus from the egg and replaces this with a diploid nucleus which comes from a body cell. So you get a diploid clone. Now they have eight species now have been cloned in mammals. And in most cases, this is done mechanically and this is done by electrofusion. You just fuse the cell. It works quite efficient in some species, very inefficient in others. We work with mouse at the Whitehead Institute. Mouse is the most difficult one to clone. And this is only possible by, really by a mechanical way to, to, to transfer this nucleus. And a student in my laboratory, Kevin Eckman, is really uh, probably one of the most proficient cloners in the country. He took the movie, which I'm going to show you, to make you appreciate what is involved in this nuclear transfer in mouse. So this is the first, is the enucleation step. Now you see here the egg to be enucleated. This is the enucleation pipette. And you go in and you suck out what's called the metaphase spin, the nucleus of the egg. There it is. And this is actually, that's the pipette to immobilize the egg. So he has to, he has to uh, orient the egg in a way that <clears throat> the nucleus is spin, which you can very difficult to see, faces the pipette. <clears throat> and he has to go through this egg shell with this pipette and then take out the nucleus. There it is. So the next step would be then the preparation of the donor nucleus, which you see there's a very small pipette, which is smaller than this. This is a cell. You suck up the cell up and down this pipe and you disrupt the cytoplasmic membrane. So what's left over is in the nucleus, which is not disrupted. You can see the nucleus is now sucked into the pipette and you leave behind the corpse of the, of the, of the cell. The next step then is the transfer of this nucleus into the enucleated egg. And you will see now again, this has to be immobilized, the egg. It's a very high magnification. And now he's expelling now. We'll be now expelling the nucleus, the nuclei in the pipette. There it comes. And now you very deeply insert this nucleus into the cytoplasm. You insert one nucleus into one egg. There it is. So this is really the transfer of a diploid nucleus into the nucleated egg to generate, again, a diploid, em, a diploid em, um, cloned embryo which has two complements of chromosomes. 
I'll show you one more here. So this is done under very high magnification. It looks very easy. It is not. So <laughs> the next step then was take these cloned embryos. You would incubate them in a, in a salt solution, and they divide, make a two-cell embryo, um, then what's called a 16-cell embryo and a blastocyst. The blastocyst is about 30 cells. And these blastocysts then, in humans, there would be about 100 cells. They would now implant into the uterus of the mother. And you wait then, and then the other end comes out, Dolly at a later age, clone mouse, pigs, a cat, cows, and there's a mule, and there's some other species. So what is the problem? The problem is it's extremely inefficient because we believe of faulty reprogramming, not resetting the genes which are important for early development and for later stage development. So most clones just die right after implantation. The blastocyst goes in the uterus and dies. Few survive to birth, but have ma many serious abnormalities and may die just after birth. Even fewer become apparently normal adults. And I really emphasize apparently. And I show you an example of such a cloned mouse. Very often one called, talks about the large offspring syndrome. This is a newborn mouse, a clone, which is about four times the size of a control. It's a monster, it didn't survive. The placenta is very abnormal, much bigger than a normal placenta. So this is typical for all species. They're very large at birth, they have problems, many die, they can't, resp um, they can't initiate respiration, but some then recover and look normal. Are they normal? It's a very important question. So when you look at such an animal, you think there must be something wrong with genes. Genes are not correctly expressed. So we tested that. And when you test in such an animal, let's say the expression of 10,000 genes, then we find that hundreds of the genes in the animal which looks normal are not correctly expressed. We believe probably 20th of the genome. That's a lot. So from this, I would argue, Ah, they may be even not normal clones. All clones, even if they appear normal, may not be really normal. But they nevertheless they do appear, are they? And that's a very controversial issue, particularly some biotech companies believe because their cows are sitting on the fields, ACT is the one here close to Boston, they must be normal. And they look at them, they prove it, they look, they have a heart, yes, they have a heart, they have serum, yes, they have serum, and then they conclude they must be normal and it's published in science. So this is a very superficial way of looking at it. In mouse, one can do this much better. And the question really is, are there hidden defects which you don't see when you just look at an animal? And they are. And this only has been possible to do in mice because of, although these animals appear quite normal up to one year of age, suddenly when you age them, they really die much earlier with major abnormalities. So you pay a price when you shortcut sperm maturation and egg maturation and fertilization. And this is a study here which came out last year, and I show you this one here where they looked at the survival curve of cloned animal plotted against the age to normal ones. And you can see the cloned ones die much earlier, a year earlier. This is 30% of lifespan than control animals. And when you looked at them, why do they die? They have major abnormalities in many, many tissues. Nevertheless, they appeared quite normal, actually totally normal, when they're one year of age. So there's some hidden defect which, you know, you need time to come out. So either you die early, but even the survivors um, are not good, um, um, are, may have really serious problems. But it's important. The problem one sees in clones is epigenetic. It's not genetic. Genetic means change of sequences. And we know that for sure, because if a cloned animal can produce a mature gamete, a sperm or an egg, the offspring is always normal. So there's no genetic change which would be passed. It is really this reprogramming, which is, of course, important for the biotech industry. I mean, they're not going to eat their clones. They're going to eat the offspring. And the offspring is, of course, normal. So I think it's, uh, it's very important to realize the difference between epigenetic and genetic. Genetic means change in gene structure and sequence mutations. Epigenetic does not mean this. It is reversible. So. Of course, cloning is very uh, closely um, sort of connected with embryonic stem cells and their potential. So what are embryonic stem cells? The embryonic stem cells are derived from these blastocysts I showed you. And curiously enough, it only works in human and mouse. But that works quite efficiently. 
Now, these cells can differentiate in culture to almost any cell type of the body, to neurons, to muscle, to blood, to bone, anything in principle. And we're learning how to do that. So what is the potential of these cells? I think the potential for medicine is for transplantation medicine. So an embryonic stem cell, as I said, can give rise to blood cells, to neurons, to beta cells, actually to all cells of the body. And we know the potential medi medical applications in include treatment of Parkinson, diabetes, of blood diseases, of leukemia patients, many others. Is there any evidence that this would work in the first place? Well, transplantation medicine, there's solid evidence that if you put into cells, normal cells into patients suffering of Parkinson or diabetes, for example, in Parkinson, those cells which die, dopaminergic cells, you can help these patients recover very much of their function. This is solid evidence. The problem is where do you get the cells? The cells come from aborted fetuses, and for example, to treat one side of a patient, you need six brains of a fetus. And for, for example, for diabetes, they come from corpses, from, the, from, from dead people. So the problem is, in this conventional transplantation medicine, is first of all, it's immune rejection. You have to treat these patients to, reject, to, to avoid rejection. But I think a major problem is availability of cells. You can't get enough fetuses. And the quality control. There's no quality control here. That's a really problem. But if you could make embryonic stem cells, you have as many cells as you want, and you can control the quality. Um, and if you do it from a patient, you would avoid immune rejection because it comes from the same patient. So let me tell you what such an experiment would look like. So an experiment we did, because people argued it doesn't work anyway. So we thought at most we just show, see, could it work. So in therapeutic cloning combined with gene therapy, what you would do is you would take a somatic nucleus from a diseased patient, for example, and derive derive an embryonic stem cell by nuclear transfer, as I showed you. You could use, actually, these cells to, to correct a genetic defect, which might have been the cause of the disease. Then you have to, in vitro, in the culture dish, differentiate the cells, the repaired cells, and finally transplant those back to the patient and see whether it helps. So we choose, as a, and I will give you one example, as a patient, a mouse, which lacks the gene which is called RAG2, which doesn't matter, but if you don't have that gene, you're sort of like a bubble boy. These are these children who are born without an immune system, so they have to live under bubble to avoid, avoid any infection. You know this, but some of these boys were treated now with gene therapy in France. And so what this gene really normally does, it's important for that peripheral B and T cells, these are lymphoid cells which fight infections. They're not present in these animals. So we thought this is our patient. And I'll show you just what it involved. It's an eight-step procedure. So this is the patient, the mouse, the bubble mouse, if you want. And you take skin cells from this, from this animal, and you make a nuclear transfer with the nucleus of this, put them in an egg, generate a blastocyst, as I showed you. And this blastocyst will be now converted to an embryonic stem cell, which is, of course, is mutant, like the patient. So now you can use what we call homologous recombination, just to repair the defect. It's a trivial operation. It works. So you repair the defect, you make an embryonic stem cell, which is now can express this mutant gene. Then you have to differentiate those cells to what's called hemolytic stem cells, put them back, and indeed the mouse now can make um, B and T cells and becomes immune competent. So in principle, that works. In a model system, it works quite clearly. So when we think about the two possibilities of therapeutic cloning and gene therapy, we have two routes. We have the one of what we call therapeutic cloning, where you take a patient cell, generate an embryonic stem cell, you could correct the gene defect, you could then differentiate those cells, put them back, and it will work. In some instances, we have shown it. The alternative, which you probably read a lot about, is somatic stem cells. Somatic stem cells are cells which are taken from an adult organism, in which many people, there's a lot of hype in this field now, which many people claim and believe that if you take a stem cell from a bone marrow, it could make neurons and maybe liver cells. There are a lot of publications. Of course, it would be very nice if we could do this because there would be no ethical problem. You wouldn't need eggs for the transfer. 
The problem is, this is a very young field. Much of the evidence which has been published has alternative interpretations. And I, I believe there's really no clear evidence which is convincing that says you can indeed, indeed transdifferentiate the bone marrow cell and something else which is not a blood cell. So I would argue there's lots of question marks here, how to use those, the potential is there, it's very interesting. We need much more research. And with the exception of bone marrow stem cells, there's no, so far, no evidence that they're useful for therapy. So many argue because the potential of these cells is there, we don't have to do this research. And I think that's wrong. I think we need to do in both areas very active research because this one we know will work and this has promise. And this is a very young field, this is an established field, the stem cells, we know that for 20 years. Whereas this field we know for a few years, two or three. Okay. So I would conclude then that what's called SCNT, to avoid therapeutic cloning, this somatic cell nuclear transfer, it's for research or for therapeutic um, purposes, I think it will work. It, will, it has worked in mouse, it will work in humans, there are only technical, there are no principal barriers to do that. We have to learn how to do this with human cells. Whereas in the reproductive cloning, as I will tell you in a minute, there are principal barriers to do that, and I think this will be very important. So, what we have to do is we have to, to adopt the methods which have been used now in the mouse, which we know the system very well, we have to adapt this to human cells, and this is very active research going on, although, of course, no nuclear transfer, uh, but learning how these stem cells can differentiate to neurons and beta cells of the pancreas and so on. So there are two questions. One is reproductive cloning. Could it be, is it, can we think about that this could be made a safe procedure, as safe as in vitro fertilization? Could we think this should be a human, a, an, acceptable, um, an acceptable technology of human reproduction? And I'm not going to go through the evidence, but what I told you a lot, I believe not. We have principal biological barriers here which I find very difficult to imagine how we can overcome them in the foreseeable future. And this is coming from much understanding we have now, particularly in cloning of mice. And of course, mice are mammals and humans are mammals, so there's no reason to assume that humans are different from mice in these principal um, biological problems. Now, does this, does this pose a problem for therapeutic application? And I believe it does not, because in therapeutic application, we make an embryonic stem cell by cloning, and we don't make a fetus. This embryonic stem cell is put in the, in the petri dish, and in one step we make neurons and the cells we want, but no fetal development. If we know all these genes which I mentioned, these hundreds of genes which are not correctly expressed, they're important for fetal development, but not for the many of the functions we see in an adult cell. So that's one of the reasons why I believe here's no principal problem, it's at best a technical problem. So I would conclude then that it is unlikely, if not impossible, to create a normal individual by nuclear cloning. That's very important. Some people disagree with this. Those people who clone humans or claim to do this, they would disagree. I think they're distorting the evidence. So the problems of reprogramming will not be solvable for the foreseeable future. I think they are principal as opposed to technical barriers to do reproductive cloning. But embryonic stem cells derived from a cloned embryo have the same potential for tissue repair as those from a fertilized embryo. So the question was, if you have a cloned and a stem cell from a cloned embryo, is it less worth than a stem cell from a fertilized embryo? And we have very hard evidence, there's no difference. That's important to realize. So the question, so what I would argue, yes cells, which have been derived from an in vitro fertilized embryo, which was not implanted, has the same potential for therapy as one from a cloned embryo. So there are two types of nuclear cloning. There's reproductive cloning, the purpose is to create a person. There's therapeutic cloning, the purpose is to create an embryonic stem cell which is really tailored to the needs of the patient and can, can serve as a source for tissue repair. So both approaches involve the transfer of a somatic nucleus into the egg and development to the blastocyst stage. In reproductive cloning, the embryo is implanted into the uterus. In therapeutic cloning, the embryo is explanted into a petri dish. That's the difference. So what have we learned from animal cloning when we think now about should it be um, tried for humans? I think we have learned that even clones that survive to birth and, lo and, and longer have serious abnormalities and die later. 
I showed you the evidence, a little bit of the evidence. And it's due to widespread epigenetic dysregulation. So I would argue most clones may have at least subtle abnormalities. And I should argue really, if you look at a mouse of one year of age, you don't know what the brain function of this is, right? I mean, this is just, these animals or cows, clone cows, they, they're not suitable to look at those functions which are probably even more important than looking at liver function, which we, of course we can measure. And I think this is all very difficult to assess, but I would argue there were even major more problems. So I think it would be very interesting to clone primates, but this has not worked. There are major technical problems, I believe. So I would argue that normal clones, if they exist, may be the absolute exception. But this doesn't really frighten some people. Some people think this is a bad idea to clone people, like these two sheep. They would think it's disgusting. But other do think it's a good idea, like Zavos, this fertility doctor from, from uh, Kentucky, who um, in, in April said they cloned no human embryo, which was eight cells, it's not a big deal, and made a big uh, fuss about this. But this is particularly interesting. What he argues is he can use, he can, he can screen pre-implantation embryos by genetic means to weed out the good ones from the bad ones. This is a serious distortion of all scientific evidence. It's a misleading of all the evidence. Because what he argues is that he could use prenatal diagnosis, which is routinely used in the clinic. And this is used to detect chromosomal operations for Down syndrome um, fetus, for example, or known genetic defects which are known to be present in the parents, does a fetus have it? It's a terrific method to do this. But the problems in clones, as I told you, is not genetic, it's epigenetic. And there's no way, no way you can test 30,000 genes for any epigenetic uh, dis dis um, problems. We all can't do it for one gene in the laboratory. So this is a gross misstatement of all the evidence. So there's clearly at present, there's no way to predict whether a given clone will develop into a normal or an abnormal individual. And so I think it's really very misleading. But unfortunately, these guys are very vocal. And some people believe. So for example, this guy, Doug Dorner, 35 years old, was quoted, I would not mind being the first person cloned. I don't mind being a guinea pig. Now here's a normal confusion. It's enormous confusion, right? Who is a guinea pig here? The one who gives, who gives the cell or what? So I think it's unfortunate. This is distorted by, by often by media coverage and by these, um, I think, very irresponsible people like Zavos and Antonori and these clones, the Raelians, I don't count anymore as being to take serious. So there are a couple of ethical issues. Now, when does life begin? Which is, of course, a very important issue. And I believe, as a biologist, biologist, you have to say it begins with fertilization. I can't say anything else. I think that's not the issue. The issue is, when is an embryo a person? That is the issue. And I think there are extreme views. Some believe an embryo has human status at the moment of fertilization. And others believe, no, only much later. It may be as a newborn, which I think more the Jewish philosophy would, would argue. Or some even believe maybe only when the children leave the house. So it is. <laughs> what, what I'm trying to argue is here there's no way, no scientific way to argue when is an embryo a person. Really, there must be other, we can't do scientifically this. So the British made sort of a compromise. They say the early embryo really deserve special status as a potential human being. But at the very early stages, during cleavage up to the blastocyst stage, this can be weighed against other potential benefits for society or therapy. Right? So I'll come back to this. So this is now human blastocyst, about 100 cells. When you implant them, it will give rise to a fetus, and the explanted will give rise to an embryonic stem cell. So some few issues which you hear often discussed. For example, life begins with conception, fertilization. Now clearly in cloning there is no conception, there is no fertilization. It is, in the biological sense, it's not new life. It's a propagation of existing life. The fertilized egg has already individuality. Yeah, it probably has genetic individuality, but certainly not anything else. We know this. Splitting an embryo gives you two different, certainly with, uh, identical twins with very different personalities. And actually, two embryos might fuse, which probably some of you in this room are derived from a fused, I mean, they don't know that, right? And they, of course, have only one personality. It's something which happens normally. 
I think the real problems, to my mind, are these here. The moral issues for producing embryo and human eggs. There's enormous market for this. There are commercial pressure. And I think this is really of big trouble. So I, mean, I will give you one potential answer for this. And then other people are very concerned that this is a slippery road. If you, believe, if you allow this taboo de cloning, it's a slippery road to cloning people. So let me come a few, at least from my point of view, address some of these issues. So one is the therapeutic application of nuclear transfer requires large numbers of human eggs. I think this is a problem. It's a major problem. How do you do this and how do you, under what circumstances, would you get that? Is that an insurmountable problem? Now, there's a recent paper came out in Science a few weeks ago where they said, where they argue that they can derive oocyte-like cells from embryonic stem cells. Now, that looks pretty interesting. It's not an oocyte yet, but it looks sort of interesting on the way. So if functional oocytes could be produced in tissue culture from an embryonic stem cell, it may be possible to, to generate these recipient eggs you need for transfer without asking a woman to don donate the eggs in tissue culture in a generic um, cell line. That would be very interesting, but we are far away from this at this point, but I think it's a technical issue to solve. I think it will work, but we're not there at all. So I think one of the key concerns against therapeutic application of nuclear transfer is, for example, also voiced in the, in the Bioethics Commission of the President, uh, headed by Leon Kass, is that the derivation of embryonic stem cells by nuclear cloning necessitates the destruction of potential human life. I think that's a major concern. And then for many, of course, becomes an, ab an abortion issue, which really has nothing to do with abortion, but I think it becomes. So let me come to this issue here. So there are two ways. So if you if think about where do human embryonic stem cells which have been produced so far, where do they came from? They came from leftover in vitro fertilized embryos, which were not implanted, right? So the intent of generating such an embryo was to generate a baby, clearly. It wasn't needed. It wasn't implanted. It was always the creation of new life. It's a unique genetic combination. It is a high potential to generate a normal baby, no doubt. In therapeutic cloning, the intent is not to generate a baby, but a tailored cell for cell therapy. It is, as I said before, it's a propagation of existing life. There's nothing genetically new. And I think most importantly, it has a very low potential to ever create a normal baby. I argue this all along. Most of those will be abnormal. So if I put this in a very simple conclusion, there are three possibilities which are faced by an embryo which is left over, which was not implanted, left from in vitro fertilization, there are a couple of hundred thousand in this country, or from a cloned embryo. It could be disposed, it could generate a normal baby, if implanted, or it could generate a normal embryonic stem cell. For a cloned embryo, you have also three possibilities. It could be disposed, could generate a normal embryonic stem cell, or an abnormal baby, if anything. So when you think about, in this country, most people believe instead of throwing away these embryos, you might as well use them for research or for therapy. This is acceptable. But you do destroy a potential human life. There's no doubt about it. If you accept this, I wonder, this should be much easier to accept because there is no potential to generate a normal baby. So I find, at least from my point of view, if you accept that, this poses, to my opinion, less ethical problems. So I would argue then, if you think about what's the difference between a fertilized and a cloned embryo, the fertilized embryo is created by conception. It's unique. There's a high potential to develop to normal babies. The cloned embryo, there's no conception, no genetic, new genetic combination. It's a product of a laboratory assisted technique. It's not a natural event. It has little or no potential to ever develop to a normal baby. So I would think between these two embryos, the clone embryo does lack some essential qualities which we sort of associate with normal, beginning normal human life, I think. So I think the point I'm going to make is one shouldn't equate those two. So from the biological point of view, then, the derivation of embryonic stem cells by nuclear cloning involves the destruction of an embryo. I think that lacks the potential to ever develop into a normal human being with any acceptable efficiency. So the British have sort of made a compromise, as I said before. They have a law which makes reproductive cloning a criminal offense and allows therapeutic cloning. So, of course, both involve the transfer of a somatic nucleus into the egg and the generation of a clone blastocyst. The dividing line is very clear. 
You implant, you go to jail. You don't implant, you don't go to jail. This is not a gray zone. This is not a slippery road, as far as I'm concerned. You either implant or you don't. You can't half implant, right? So I think the slippery road argument, in this case, it's also enforceable. It is clearly because you know you implant or you didn't. And the argument from the Justice Department here is saying, we can't enforce this, we can't punish a woman who doesn't implant in the doctor. Well, I think then you would change the law, so you can enforce it. <laughs> so, I think it the, the, so I think this is really, um, at least biological, it makes sense to do this, and it's certainly enforceable. There's not a slippery road. I think slippery road would be if you say you allow it to manipulate an embryo for 14 days, you make a time limit, and it turns out maybe three weeks is better, maybe four weeks is better, and you slippery down to go further on. I think implantation is yes or no, black or white. The problem is, I think, are these characters here. <laughs> so these are the, I sh showed you before, this is Bishop Bossolier from Clonate, this is Israel, this is Antonori, this fertility doctor from, from uh, Italy who does this, and this is now here, Rael, in his spacesuit testifying in the United States of Congress. <laughs> this, is, um, um, this is again uh, Zavos and Bossolier testifying in the United States of Congress. And I'm afraid these people, what they do is, with their distortion, I think they really affect, I think, the legislation as we see it developing. And I think part of this is that certainly our administration believes anything which has to do with embryos or embryonic stem cells is very suspect. And I think it's probably driven partially by this, these rather un, uh, irresponsible people like I showed you. And I want to close really with with some of the legislation which is now passed in the House, which is the Belden Stupak Bill, which was passed twice. And the underlying philosophy, I think, is regardless of its ultimate destiny, all human embryos are simultaneously human beings. I think this is, if you believe that, I think you should have a problem. You must have a problem with many of these things. So it led to an interesting paragraph. Which is, so prohibition of human cloning. So it shall be unlawful for any person and so on and so forth perform or attempt to perform human cloning, to participate in such an attempt, and to ship or receive any cloned embryo. But this is really the interesting paragraph. Importation. It shall be unlawful for any person or entity, public or private, knowingly to import for any purpose an embryo produced by human cloning or any product derived from such an embryo. Now, this is pretty extreme if you think about it. If a patient, let's say in this country, goes to England, in case they get the techno technology established, and gets his diabetes treated, let's assume so, they would arrest him at Boston Airport because he would carry a product derived from such an embryo, but either cut it out or put him into jail. And there are big fines for that. So I think it's a very extreme um, bill which criminalizes research, which I think is sort of the first in this country. But I think it's driven in part by, by uh, unfortunately, by these, this publicity from from these um, renegade people. Um, now, this bill has passed twice in the House, and the Senate is debating it, and the Senate is not clear what's going to happen. There's an alternative bill in the Senate, which is more closer to the one like this, and the other one is more closer to the British bill. It's not clear what will happen, I think. So let me close just acknowledging some people of people in my group who led to much of the research which I talked about, the basis, which is my cloning group here, and this is really mostly students. This is Kevin Egan. I showed you a movie from him. He's one of the really the people who introduced the technology for me. There are three other students and a postdoc um, who really made much of the work I talked about and which we um, take as the basis for our scientific um, assessment of this technology. So thank you very much for your attention. So we have time for a few questions. Uh, let's see if we have some hands here so you can find. No questions. Oh, here we go. Uh, aside from the political issue, if uh, therapeutic, if therapeutic abortion, uh, therapeutic uh, cloning has been and uh, has been known for 20 years, why have we seen? little or no success in the curing of uh, a disease such as cystic fibrosis where the defective gene has been known for, I think, about 15 years. 
So cystic fibrosis is it's much more difficult than, let's say, blood disease. The problem with cystic fibrosis is the cells which are, give you the symptoms are the linings of the lung. And they have the problem this, this, this transport is not is defective. That's why you get these infections in, in the gut. Now, to replace by cell therapy the cells of your lung lining, that's a very difficult issue. So th transplantation medicine works very well with bone marrow disease because it's put in the bone marrow and the cells distribute where they, they have to go. It works reasonably well, let's say, for pancreas, for, for diabetes, because you have the beta cells, you put them anywhere, let's say, under the kidney capsule or so, and they will work. For Parkinson's, very interesting. You know where the cells have to be, which are dying in the Parkinson patient. You, by stereotactic injection, just deposit these cells into this area. And they produce the dopam dopamine, which is lacking. And they, I think it's amazing. They improve enormously the, the, the quality of these people, um, of life and their function. So I think transplantation medicine, yes, you can replace a heart if you have the right donor. But you cannot make a heart in culture. No way you can do that. But you could make heart cells in culture. You can inject them in a damaged heart. It has been shown to repair some of the defects. So the problem, there are two, two problems in transplantation medicine. One is to have the cells and have, them, have the immune problems taken care of. And the other one is delivery. And for some diseases, delivery is a real problem. And cystic fibrosis would be one where I think delivery of the cells to the right spot is a real problem. We'll go to the next section here. Why are placental stem cells never mentioned as a source? Well, placental stem cells is a very new development. So those are stem cells which give rise to the placental lineage. It's a very different lineage from the embryo lineage. And the placental stem cells, uh, they are very likely and not very useful for replacing somatic tissues. They are known to really contribute to the placenta, but not to the embryo. And of course, when we want to treat a patient, we don't want to treat the placenta, we want to treat the somatic organs. So this is a very interesting cell line, but it's probably not useful for any therapeutic purposes. Uh, hi, pa Paul Landsman, how are you doing? Um, question is, uh, what do you think about uh, animals transportation, you know, transporting uh, animal um, lungs and hearts into humans? Do you think that's going to be a possibility someday? And another question is, um, we won't hold it to you, but um, how would you invest in this exciting field of biotechnology? <laughs> Sorry, can you, can you repeat the last question? Um, how would you invest in this field of biotechnology? <laughs> We won't hold you to it, of course. OK. So the first question is, uh, you need a donor animal. And the people, what people believe is the best donor animal would be a pig, because pigs and humans have a um, lot of similarities in many ways. <laughs> so, so the problem is, in, in, in pigs, is there's what's called the acute rejection. So the pig has a, certain, has a certain protein on its cells, on the cells, which are right away target for, actually, for serum in humans. These, if you transplant pig cells in a human, they're destroyed within 20 minutes. It's called the hyperacute rejection. Now, what has been now done is they knocked out that gene in pigs. So now you have pigs which don't have this protein anymore. So then, when you transplant some tissue from those pigs to human, they would not be rejected by hyperimmune, hyperactive rejection right away. Now come all the other problems of xenotransplantation, and they are serious. So are they solvable? Some people believe, yes, you just have to replace the immune system of pigs and make it humanized or whatever. Maybe. I mean, this is the future, and I think cloning helps you to do this. So I think there's a potential to do that. But I think we're very far away from this. Now, investing. I think, um, so there are a couple of companies who were built on stem cell technology. Geron is one, right, as you know. And I think they have a very hard time now in this investment climate. Because of the, and I, part of this is I certainly is a political situation that people believe it's a hot potato. If you work with human embryonic stem cells, it's a hot potato. How can you attract anyone? I think that's a reality to this. So I think that's problem at the moment. It would be not a good idea, I think, to, to invest in a company who thinks they could generate these cells for transplantation and using human embryonic stem cells for that. But that's my very humble 
point of view of, of investment strategy. Let's come back over to this side. Hello, I'd like to know if uh, you could give a brief overview of the use of uh, retroviral insertion of genes in gene therapy. Yeah, so this is uh, this was the strategy I mentioned. So there were 10 bubble boys, which similar to almost, right? They didn't have um, B and T cells in France uh, because of a single gene defect. And what he's referring to is is a um, is a therapy which looked very good. They took um, the cells, the blood cells from these boys, from these children, and transduced, using a retrovirus, this gene. And they put them back into these boys. And it was amazing. They got, like almost, they made B and T cells and they were really, in a way, cured. So it was the real first success story of gene therapy. The problem came up when they waited a little longer because three of these children got leukemia. Why did they get leukemia? I worked my life with retroviruses, so I, I know these things quite well because we struggled with this. The virus you put in in such a cell can integrate anywhere in the genome in many different positions. And what happened in these three children that got leukemia, the virus had integrated into a gene which is known, it's called an oncogene, which is known when activated gives rise to these leukemias. So the virus activated that gene as a result of its randomly getting into the, in the genome. So the question is, is it random actually? It's a major question of interest. <clears throat> and I think looking at Three out of 10, you have to look how many integrations took place and all these calculations have to be made. It may not be random. There might be preferential integration sites for this virus. And that's, of course, is an unacceptable risk, which these researchers did not know. And I think they right away went to the public and they did the right things and say it was very unexpected but very troublesome. So I think gene therapy with an agent, which you can't, you don't know where it ends up, has an inherent risk. And that's what these, um, these have. The gene therapy I talked about, where we take embryonic stem cells and now we repair the, the um, mutated gene with homologous recombination, there's almost no risk because you repair it, you check whether you did what you thought you had, did, and you can test in culture, and there's nothing wrong with this because you can test everything, and then you put this back to the, to the patient. So this is a very different type of approach than, you, but you cannot use this approach for adult stem cells, like let's say for, for bone marrow stem cells, because they're so rare. One in 100,000 cells is a bone marrow stem cell. You can't grow these. You can't do these manipulations. You can only use a virus, which infects everything, and then you select the right cells out. But you never know what you did. So that's the big difference between these two types of approaches of gene therapy. Uh, one last question. Yeah, you're right here in front. You have to get a microphone to him, yeah. You spoke a bit about uh, how there are hundreds of thousands of, of uh, IVF cells that are, that are out there in the US right at the moment. And I was curious, under the existing law and climate, what is acceptable use for these cells and what's happening with all of them? So I think the, the law says it's not criminalized. I think you need clearly parental consent. That's very important, right? And that I think people believe who want to, want to get this um, on a, on, a, on, a, on a solid fooding, there shouldn't be commercial rewards for this. I mean, it should be really the commercial aspects should be taken out of this. I think the fate of these embryos is pretty much a nimble because I think many clinics don't know what to do with them because either they get the permission from the parents to destroy those. If they don't have, they might be um, sued for whatever. Um, so I think it's a very unsettled situation of those, of these hundreds of thousands of, of embryos in, in which I know there. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a, just a couple more things to take care of. Uh, first, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Kimberly Ann Francis, who chaired the committee that uh, organized these events. Uh, Kim?
distinguished speakers, alumni, parents, <laughs> students, friends. Welcome. My name is Kim Francis. I'm a member of the class of 1978 and Tech Day Chair for 2003. And what a program we've had this morning, haven't we? Very good. <laughs> On behalf of myself and the Tech Day Committee, I want to thank my sincere appreciation for all the speakers who gave up their time and their Saturday to come in and discuss these important topics. Uh, fast times at MIT, we've learned much to learn about ourselves and our choices as we move into some of these very complex technological applications. And I encourage the audience to continue your learning by visiting the website, visiting the, the uh, speaker's pages, and viewing their publication. Of course, a program of this magnitude cannot be put together without a lot of dedication from several support teams. I'd like to recognize the members of the Technical Tech Day Committee. Uh, I'm going to read off their names and would you stand? Barbara Greenberg, 77, Keith McKay, 97, Kim Hunter, 86, Leon Katz, 64, Bill Leach, 56, Holly Schmidt, 87, David Stork, 76, Sarika Vahala, 96, Doug Vincent, 89, and Marvin Grossman, 51. Thank you all. We challenged each other kindly and gently under the guidance of Elizabeth Durant and the Alumni Association Office, and I want to thank her and her staff for helping us put this program together. Tech Day is a very special day in the MIT community. You all have come back here several years. I would like to invite you, in order for us to continue to improve this event, to fill out a blue evaluation form. They're available in the lobby, and there's also boxes uh, to drop them in in the lobby so that we can continue to bring the best of topics to you. We also have two more speakers after lunch, so I will ask you to return promptly at 2 o'clock for the beginning of the afternoon program. At this time, I give you back to Jim Lash for another presentation. Uh, we have one piece of official business to do, and to do this, I need Bill Heck to come up here. Yesterday at, uh, at the meeting of the uh, board of your alumni association, uh, the board voted the following resolution in recognition of Bill's part-time retirement. Whereas the honoree has presided over the Alumni Association longer than anyone else besides Ellen Swallow Richards' husband, and whereas as director of the Educational Council, he first displayed to his MIT co-workers a taste and capacity for airline travel that amazes ordinary mortals. And that, no doubt, partly reflects the passion for flying and aircraft, which once found him teaching an association president how to tell 727s, MD-80s, and other jetliners one from another. Whereas he oversaw the association while it quintupled its gift total, chose its first woman president, made friends with resource development, successfully spun off technology review, set an unprecedented string of fundraising records and showed its peers nationwide the right way to put your organization on the internet. And, whereas the honoree possesses the exquisite flair for diplomacy required of anyone whose job description says that you must serve three masters and that you can assume they will rarely, if ever, be in complete agreement with each other, and whereas he knows by face and name so many thousands of MIT graduates that some may wonder how there can be room left in his cranium for his encyclopedic knowledge of topics from Alvar Aalto to the Zesiger Center, not to mention an astonishing store of non-MIT knowledge, and whereas his affection for his alma mater is deep and palpable as reflected in his lengthy hours on the job his vigorous representation of the interests and views of the alumni, his unstinting service as advisor to generations of lucky freshmen, and his richly deserved bronze beaver, and whereas he extends that same type of loyalty to friends and family, 
the latter including a group of grandchildren who are growing up understanding better than most the concept of deep grandfatherly devotion. And whereas he has been described by a prominent alumna as, quote, one of the most huggable men you could ever hope to meet, unquote, <laughs> it is therefore with profound gratitude that we hereby congratulate and commend William J. Hecht, proud member of the MIT class of 1961, for his past, present, and future service to the Massachusetts of Institute of Technology. This resolution, voted by the Board of Directors of the Association of Alumni and Alumni of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology on this sixth day of June, 2003. You can say something if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to say just a couple of words. Uh, one of them is that each of you in this audience represents uh, 10 or 100 other individuals, alumni and alumni, spouses, friends, that uh, it has really been a privilege to serve. Um, my good friend Paul Gray <clears throat> has a wonderful phrase about MIT. He refers to it as this special place. Uh, I would add to that it's not only special, it's unique. And what's even more interesting about it and delightful is that the people who are product of this place are extraordinary. Uh, this job, for many of my peers in this business, is a pain in the neck, or perhaps a little lower. <laughs> this job of working with you sometimes has been a challenge and occasionally a frustration, but has ended up generally an enormous pleasure, a pleasure because you're extraordinary people and because you support this extraordinary place. And I encourage you to keep doing that. Thank you.